We're good to go, Emery. Okay. All right. Normally, um, so it's just typically just a workshop, but we do have uh, an agenda item E4 for uh, possible action. So I just wanted to uh, make a motion to go into a session. Yes. And a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So just, just for the group, um, the, those attending, these workshops, as I mentioned, are typically, and today for the most part, they are just um, for discussion. And so 90% of these items, that's what we're here for. There's a, one, a new business under E4 having to do with HP Smith Park that council may take action in terms of a vote. Otherwise, um, please don't expect anything to come out of here today with a specific resolution. Um, it's really just an opportunity for us as a council to um, follow up on some things and move things that have been on our agendas along, as well as introduce uh, new topics for discussion. So the first one that we'll take on today is actually, um, and just to confirm, we don't have any other presentations or we're not deleting anything from this as far as no. I know. Okay. So the first one we are going to talk about, we, we had introduced in a previous workshop has to do with um, the use of, of ground covers within the rights of way. And um, I, I think um, John will help us through some of that, but I didn't, we did have a grid that I think that you created. Yeah. Are we able to bring that up um, so the group can let me follow along with us here? And then, um, John, if you want to, while we're bringing that up, maybe just talk through sort of what, what, you know, why we're here and sort of what you're struggling with from a code enforcement and what the residents may be struggling with from a just uh, understanding and, and clarity. And introduce yourself, please. <clears throat> yes, that was going to be the first thing. I'm John Robitaille. I am the building official for the city of Lewis. I'm on board for about three months now. Started in the end of March. Uh, we're struggling a little bit with uh, some of the issues as far as people having plantings in the right of way or uh, ground cover or shells parking. When you get into the whole parking issue with that, uh, we're just kind of looking for some direction from mayor and council as to how they want us to enforce this. So, and I'm, I'm working on getting this onto the screen. On the, uh, the grid that Amory had created, she gave three separate uh, scenarios between the curb, the sidewalk and the curb. If their residence has a curb, but no sidewalk, or if there is no curb or sidewalk present and how Council's feeling was about different types of uh, ground cover material, grass, mulch, with or without plantings, trees, shrubs, the size of the shrubs, whether they're less than 12 inches tall or more than 12 inches tall. Uh, council's feeling on having concrete, asphalt, or shells, stone, in that area, uh, whether we council was amenable to having irrigation in those areas, uh, pavers, landscaping blocks, fences, and retaining walls. And to be clear, this is on in every single part of Lewis. This will yes, this right. is not any this. specific community, any specific area. It is citywide, right? And that's why we laid out the three different contexts because it may be different mm -hmm. in an area where you have um, curb, grass strip, sidewalk, or curb, grass versus no curb, just grass. Because all of those things are are a little different. But we want to be able to be consistent across the city so that anywhere you have that specific. How do we deal with where lawns in certain parts of town are stone? And in some parts of town, we're not allowing people to have lawn, essentially yards that are okay, stone. So, so that's a separate issue that that I think we need to address. One, we've never told people they can't have stone as 
yard cover. Mm -hmm. But the problem that comes with that is we're counting stone parking areas as lot coverage, but not stone landscaped areas. But what we found is that there are places where people put down stone, they say it's for, for landscape area, and then they're using it as parking. Right. But that's not the right of way that's on on the individual property. So that's a different issue that we need to address it as a separate thing. This is more where you get beyond the property line into the right of way. And as you know, the, the right of, between the right of way line and the roadway, it's city or state, depending on which road it is, property, but the property owner, the adjacent property owners required or, or responsible for the maintenance. We have issues in town. Uh, I'll, I'll give examples of, issues in, in the different contexts that we've laid out here. In the town side, we have areas where people have um, in the quote unquote grass strip or vegetated strip between the sidewalk and the curb where people have planted vegetation that grows high and then interferes with the walkability of the sidewalk. That that's a challenge that we, you know, so so we need to discuss what is appropriate to be planted in that specific area. Is it just grass? Is it grass and low plantings? Is it, you know, what what is acceptable there? Um, what what we're dealing with, um, you know, there are other places. Um, I'm thinking Pilot Town Village is an example of where you do not have a sidewalk. So you've got curb and then it goes right to, there's a portion of the right of way that is still looks like the front yard of, of the property owner, but is not what's appropriate there. Uh, you know, what sometimes we see people plant trees in those areas and the trees, if it's too close to the roadway, can interfere with say trash trucks or visibility of stop signs. And then the other context you have is like over on the beach where you've got a wide right of way, a narrow roadway. So you've got in some cases up to 10 feet of right of way that is city owned, expected for the property owner to maintain it. Um, and is it, you know, is stone okay? Is mulch okay? What what is acceptable? Because what we were seeing with the in all of the many beach parking discussions over the years was that the encroachments that the city should. I mean, the message we came away with was that the city should not be issuing permits that allow encroachments. We recently denied one, and the encroachment would have been mulch and like a stone edging. The property owner then put in sod because that's the you know acceptable ground cover. The sod is now getting torn up because you don't have a curb and people are you know driving on it as they're rounding the, the corner. Additionally, it is hard to, if you have a, a sprinkler system, it's hard to keep the you know one i think that we can probably agree that we don't want sprinkler heads in the right of way period right. but again we felt that there are multiple contexts and it it seems that we keep finding ourselves in positions where it's not entirely clear and it's putting us in conflict with mm -hmm. property owners so for the benefit of property owners and for um, staff and the general public, we wanted to, to kind of go through and say, okay, in this context, mm -hmm. this is acceptable. In this context, this is acceptable. So I'm gonna pull it up. I just added it to the agenda. Now, 
public on Zoom and everybody in the room should be looking at the, um, the matrix that we laid out. Um, this isn't necessarily a comprehensive list of, of ground cover alternatives. If there's something that you, you know, it seems to have been missed. We tried to be as comprehensive as we could, um, but we we do believe that these are the the three different contexts that we have in town, where you have curb no sidewalk, curb with side, curb you know curb curb no sidewalk, curb no curb or sidewalk, and sidewalk grass strip and curb. Um, I think the other thing about the tackle is that as with a lot of issues with Lewis is the pre-existing conditions right you know how are we going to deal with that as those change or, or right and I those... think pre-existing conditions we do need to deal with especially when you you know if you determine that um certain native grasses below 12 inches are not appropriate in an area but they already exist I think we'll then have to have the discussion of, okay, so when does it need to be removed? In the case of the strip between the sidewalk and the curb, that becomes more of an issue mm -hmm. than it does if it's not obstructing anything. Right. But we do get complaints um, from, you know, avid walkers, people with disabilities who, who need the full width of the sidewalk because they're in a wheelchair, we do get complaints when there is not the proper clearance on the sidewalk. Right. Um, can I share, um, so former mayor Jim Ford sent uh, an e email to, I think we've all seen it. And, you know, this is a complicated issue. And we're not, as Andrew said earlier, we're not gonna resolve anything today because there's a lot of factors, but I thought he captured the, the theme of this pretty well in a sense that we're talking about Right away, we're talking about safety and the city operations that are needed that we have jurisdiction over with right of ways versus beautification in which residents have planted trees, bushes, whatever might be there. Mm -hmm. And I think we have, I mean, I think there's value in having residents who want to beautify, let them beautify. However, they, there needs to be an understanding that if it's somehow impacting city operations or safety issues, that the city will have to come back and cut back a, a tree limb or taller grass. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's exactly what we're looking for is, yeah. you know, where it, a, a, a flower bed within the right of way. And we've seen this even when you guys have looked at lease extensions in the past a flower bed in the right of way that is not anywhere that, you know, people park or um, it, it's not impeding, you know, emergency access. In, in some cases, council has said, that's fine, it can remain. But when it gets into where it's obstructing, you know, if in an area where it, it's obstructing parking, and it's not an older existing one, it's done, you know, it's new. The, the policy, the encroachment policy that was approved in 2018 says it needs to be removed. Um, but, but then, you know, but the other thing that, again, we see happen is people putting, for instance, stone in the right of way that, ends up being kind of their reserved parking place right. separate right. from their their driveway where really without the stone that would have been available for for public parking so that's one of the things that ends up creating conflict um you know again um where you in areas where like again, what we see kind of more on this side where there are sidewalks is um, vegetation that it impedes pedestrian passage or that um, that grows out beyond the curb that then creates an issue for either cars parking, trash pickup, um, 
you know, all of those types of things. Yeah, we operate with the concept of safety, as Neil right. said a moment ago. Well, that's, that's why I think it might be an easier way to point. tackle it is yeah. rather than be dogmatic about what can and can't go there is just create a policy around right. safety. Correct. Right. But if it's nebulous, it's right. going to, we're going to keep in hard, conflict. Hard to exactly. And Marie, have you noticed any situations where your ish, the issue is line of sight for safety of driving around corners and other things yes. in the city as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. And so typically, some of those the, seagrasses get pretty tall and then they. Right. So okay. typically, it, you know, with tree branches and shrubs, that's, we, we're, we typically address that through code enforcement anyway. Um, you know, where it's grown in, but, you know, it, it becomes what's appropriate to plant in, in a certain location. Because if you do plant a low shrub that grows up to this, and now you can't see the stop sign, or um, or it, it now creates an impediment to the, the trash truck turning the corner because it's, it's growing, you know, should that shrub be, is it a matter of trimming the shrub? For the future, again, we're not having people remove shrubs that have been there, but should we say, no, you can't plant a shrub in this area? Well, just look at it from a height. Yeah. But it's not always height. height. It's, it's the, the, it's width, the width. 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 And it's type of vegetation, too. Yeah, right, okay. <clears throat> but it still right. comes back to city operations, whether the city needs that piece for right. something, for, for, for replacing a pipe, for example, or safety. I mean, that's really, I mean, I would hate to have a policy where we forced everyone to clear out the right of way just for some, for what, for some future use? Well, we're, we're not talking about, again, we're, what we're looking at here is not going back and having people clear out what's there. We're looking forward oh, right. when somebody you know, again, the, the thing that, that oh, really yeah. created an issue was, you know, somebody submitted a permit. They, it was for hardscaping and it, it combination of hardscaping and landscaping. And it included like stone edging and mulch mm -hmm. in the right of way, which, I mean, you were, you were there. Um, I think you were there too. When, you know, we, I, I said emphatically at the last round of beach parking that we would not issue permits for encroachment because that was one of the things we were being heavily criticized for having done in the past. So we did not, we did not issue a permit for encroachment and um, it, it put us in a position where, well, some people have put down mulch without a permit. And just because this, this property owner applied for a permit and did kind of what he should have done. Um, and, and is it all encroachments? Is mulch okay? I mean, it really kind of brought up this whole issue of we need to discuss what is appropriate in the right of way at, you know, for a adjacent property owner to do in the right of way versus what is not. And, you know, that will vary depending on kind of the right of way configuration, which is why we tried to lay out the contexts. <laughs> I just want if you could just Terry Poray, 19 Arbor View Road. Just want to make a quick comment. Um, I've seen some members of the council focus on the issue of safety and uh, operational needs. Uh, you raised the issue of parking. I would like uh, people to also acknowledge that this is an important consideration. The ability for people who do not live near the beach to be able to go there occasionally in the evening when I cannot bike, for instance, I like to take my car and watch the sunset, Sometimes it becomes a, a problem because there is not enough parking space. There are not enough parking spaces available there. So operational issues, yes. Safety, <laughs> yes. But also the fact, as you said, that some of these encroachments basically result in the private appropriation by the property owner of the parking space that is in front of their house. And that is not right. This is a public good. This is something that belongs to all of us and people, I'm talking for the future, I'm not talking of things that are already planted at 10 feet high, but for the future, people should not be able to gravel 
the, the public right of way in front of their houses and claim that as their private property. And uh, sometimes some people go as far as putting a sign which says no parking or private parking when in fact these are public lands. So I, I would like the council to acknowledge that there are three issues, public safety, operational needs and parking, particularly in the area where parking is a rare commodity. Thank you. Respect to the private parking, that is an ordinance that we did, but it was temporary signage and such that should be getting enforced now, as far as I understand. Well, where we put the yeah, the, they can't put chairs, cones. Right. That, that's signs. true. Now but, there are signs that are that have been approved, but right. But but then if you plant a flower bed, no, he's saying specifically about right. signs that say no parking. Right, and and we actually um, just a few weeks ago, our parking enforcement contacted somebody who had a sign that said no no parking it was on you know right. they removed it um after trying to make contact with the, the adjacent property owner they removed yeah. the sign because it was not they you know you can't tell somebody they can't park right. in, um in that area I remember that. that was well, the same thing. So the signs are what's dictating it. Whether someone puts gravel or mulch or whatever is there doesn't preclude someone from the public from, from parking there. Um, it does not. If you put, but if you put actual landscaping, it, it could. Well, that's different. We're not. Right. Well, or, I don't think we're talking about putting down railroad ties or. No. Well, I mean, like that. so so that's why we've got a, a number of things. We've got grass mulch with no plantings, mulch with stone edging, trees, Reach any wall. plants and shrubs that yeah. are small. We've Right, Places. we've got concrete, asphalt, retaining right. wall, landscape mm -hmm. blocks. And that's why I just want to be clear that this is not just about, you know, one or two areas of town. For the, the air, Another area that we need to be cognizant of is the, the uh, trail. Um, there are people that have planted gardens in there. They have art, uh, uh -huh. sculptures and such in there. Right. So to your point, that's why I suggest, you know, maybe being dogmatic about what can and can't and, and rather than adopting a policy um, may be the way to go. I, I, you know, I just think you say you put a list, someone's going to come up with something that's not on the list. And, and, and there is always the ability if something's not on the list and you want it, it if something is not permitted to be in the right of way and a property owner wants to do something they can request a license agreement. I, I mean, I think at some point we, I think we're probably gonna have to talk about, um, and we'd have to work with Delta on, on this, with all of that property along the, the trail, we, mm -hmm. we may need to talk about a license agreement because people, I mean- it, It's not the city's right, right. Way. and 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 there right. needs to be, but, you know, we, again, that's, that's another issue where we've had people planting things within the trail right of way, which might be fine when it's planted, but then it grows out into the right of way right. and you have, you know, a person on a bike having to swerve to, to avoid it. And it's a very congested area. So well, uh, can I point out just on that real quickly, one, one of the, just for clarity purposes, there are folks who live over on, on the bike trail who did plant gardens and other mm -hmm. things, but that was because Del Dot failed to remove right. all this ballast. And it, and it was ugly. Yeah, it, yeah. It was completely ugly. And they were exactly. and, and their intent was to beautify the area because Del Dot and still Del Dot won't acknowledge that that's their responsibility. Right. Well they, they know it's their responsibility. They want to have yeah, the, yeah, they don't have the itself. fund what yeah. they've said is they don't have the funds to right. to yeah. remedy it. Yeah. I mean I would just say no, they're not doing you know, it. similarly is if they are the city rights of way, the city's not been maintaining those those rights of way over the years in certain in certain areas. And so, when well, it comes time, I mean, so the right of way adjacent to your property is the is the, the um, up a, up to the road is the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. Right. So putting down mulch or other things is a way of maintaining that. Cool right. Point. So and and that's fine, but again, I think council needs to make the decision of. What is the what are the appropriate things that can go in that right of way? Because I'm going to tell you right now, even even from the staff perspective, it's not a clear message, and it, it makes it. I mean, it, John, you, you're on the front line with this. It, it it makes it very difficult to be consistent because 
it, it's you know it, if you recall we we had the the one property owner on Cape Henlopen Drive that had put a whole bunch of stone down right. on the right. the alley the unimproved alley next to his residence and when we came to council because we had gotten complaints about it we came to council he requested a license council said no the stone needs to be removed so you know it it's that went beyond the right of way into a yeah, paper street said, no yeah. it didn't it, uh, no right of way is a paper street that's the that's the thing right, right. Well, anything that is dedicated dedicated do you want to <laughs> any thoughts glenn I'm, well, I feel like anything, I'm it's, it's where a street was um platted but is unimproved so right it's the unimproved portion of a platted street right. we bring up yeah if, if folks from the public want to speak please please come forward uh, my name is blake kimbrough i'm at 330 pilot town road um so there's also the instance where i thought far it's a state road so do we know what the state has said about any of this I mean, technically what i was told is people need to be able to pull over to the side of the road so all along my front it says no parking but if you're the partner in the lease or the owner of the property you're allowed to park there but if it's just the 10 feet of you know the right of way then everybody should be able to pull off for 10 feet is it that whole strip is it i mean because some people have fences so it's going to be very confusing when sometimes it's about parking and having the ability to park there when sometimes it's really just pulling off the side of the road in case your car what is your address 330 30. pilot town, pilot town right. so right you're and, and you're right so so where where you are one i don't think the right of way is extremely wide yeah, I have no but <laughs> but the ability to put something right up to the you, you would not be able to put an obstruction in the right of way because it would affect the ability of somebody to pull off in an emergency mm -hmm. right and do we do do we get like i don't even see on you know, my plat where it says exactly where the right of ways are because yeah, maybe people don't even well it, i don't even really know it, to be it, honest it, exactly it where it tells says, you so. it, where it is but then you'd have to kind of measure it from you know your your survey would have like your house and the improvements but you would have to measure from there to figure out where exactly the right of way is okay thank you and and i know uh, pilot town road side, pilot yeah, town road it jogs especially right. on the canal side right. um but typically a it, it, tip right typically we where you do stone, have a no, sidewalk you have those, and those that's iron posts that's correct that's and that's included that in it. your lease right, right, right. and that's how that determines your property right um, but in the lease it does say what you're allowed to do on the property right so that's another thing that other people won't have right so right yeah. with this grid are you expecting us at some point to come back and say Yes, no, yes, with condition these conditions. Yeah, that's, I think that's where we need to get to. John, do you have you uh opinion on, would you be able to do the same exercise on your side as uh, I have you've done the I have started that, yes. Okay. I'll create this. <laughs> uh we Janelle and I sat down and, and established a list, an initial list. Uh and Anne Marie took it to the next level. Sure. Sure. Uh, you've made comments yourself saying like yeah grass i have fine. i have my thoughts yes okay. uh like say grass i i have yes across the board right for grass right okay. for all three of the categories yeah. uh mulch munch mulch if you will oh sorry about that typo she was munch. hungry <laughs> i was hungry it was lunchtime that would be another in in my interpretation that would be yes across the board also but can i speak no to plantings? that for a second excuse me go, go ahead. ahead you go ahead please is that the mulch with no plantings yes okay the the second line item i'm going to uh, speak to that for a second if you don't mind um mulch has the ability to float and in rain events that we have and we frequently have heavy rain events here uh if mulch is floating and being moved off a planted area into a curb line uh and it's going to a drain box that becomes a problem for our stormwater management yes it does. so i i would like you to contemplate that and that effect and and take that under consideration okay okay thank you and marie is mulch an issue for our our streets department when the uh, street sweepers 
Well, it, it, it'll sweep it. Um, but but does it damage the equipment? It doesn't hurt the equipment. Okay. Uh, but I think from uh, you know to Tim's point, one of the things that we've talked about for a number of years that we know is coming but isn't here yet is an, what's called an MS4 permit. Um, under the Clean Water Act, which is Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, that's the S4, um, which is a requirement that municipalities um, have a plan for um, water improvement of the quality of runoff. So a huge part of that is reducing what goes into the, the gutter and then ultimately the storm drain system and then gets discharged. So I, I think to, to Tim's point, um, yeah, mulch is, is, is something the council will need to discuss whether it's appropriate yep. because of those issues. May, maybe it's appropriate, but it, it is something that it becomes something that goes into the stormwater system when it runs off. Right. Uh, to that effect, then, a stone edging around the mulch would limit the amount of mulch that would be carried into the the next, the third line item right. would be limiting the amount of mulch. It would mulch. inhibit the flow. That, right, I agree. But then you get into, uh, I think, the size of the stone. You know, how do you, how do you, if you're, how do you? describe it and maintain that also and i'm not prepared to discuss that well, that's what I was I let's know. not get into the that yeah today. i don't want to yeah. get into that but i'm just reacting to that no i understand yeah. and you're what right you're bringing we, up is it it's a lot more complex it's than, much and, which more, is yes. why it's very difficult exactly it, yeah i i feel his on pain the fly. right and his cruise plant pain okay i feel so it. you 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 endorse the stone edging yes and again we could have a a, a side con yeah, side conversation uh, and kind of figure, figure out the parameters for that. Right. May I ask you a direct question? Are you, do you plan to go through the whole list here right now, John? Is I, that what you'd like to do or what is- If council like? wishes. I mean, I would just like, I don't want to get into a deep discussion. I just want to get his initials. If, if you were to fill this exactly. out, you must have some opinions on what, like based on your experience and based on what the, what you're hearing out there on the field, I would imagine you have a, some opinions. I, on I have uh, developed my opinions, yes, okay. and my and how I interpret. I mean, that's all I want to do right now is yes, no, yes, no. I mean, if you uh, can okay. quickly go through that, and um, then if we want to go back to him and fine. on individual basis and say, you know, yes. yeah. Thanks, I think John. getting it, the big picture might help so that yeah. then we can determine what those exactly. parameters mm -hmm. around what are his it opinions is. Now? Yeah, exactly. Please go ahead, John. Okay. Um, let's run down yeah, yeah, yeah. column Great. then. Exactly. I like so that. between the sidewalk and curb, starting with the trees, I would say no. Yeah. Okay. Plants and shrubs less than 12 inches, yes. Plants and shrubs over 12 inches, no. Can I ask for a clarification, please? Is this 12 inch height or width? Oh. This is height. This is it's height. height. Uh, you're going to run into a problem down the road where the width of it right. is going to expand past. So think of the curb here and the right. sidewalk here. The resident would be required to. Right, like, and this and this is create a box and keep that shrub inside the box. Right. So Correct, that, and that would this, be one of the details that we need to to correct. note on it. Correct, and this twelve inch business height, if we understand it to be height, that is at maturity. Correct, not at the time that's installed. Correct, is is that yes. your intention? Yes. That's okay. that's the intention of it. Yes. Thank you. Not to see. Okay. Okay. Uh, concrete. Again, we're still in the side between the sidewalk and curb column. Concrete, I would say yes. Asphalt, mm, okay. I just have a, a personal opinion against asphalt in that. That, again, I, is my own. Let's know. Okay. Uh, it could be done. I, I think concrete or planting would be much more aesthetically right. pleasing than asphalt. Okay. Uh, stones and shells would be yes. Irrigation, no. Native grasses less than 
12 inches, yes. Pavers, yes. Landscaping blocks, yes. Fences, no. And retaining walls, no. Okay. Or with no sidewalk? Again, grass would be yes. Mulch with no plantings. I had originally put a yes. I've changed that based on uh, Tim's comments. Mulch with stone edging, yes. Trees, no. I, again, trees are just, they're just going to be too big for well, that space. We'll talk about it later. Right, and, and, that's, and if the city plants tree, street trees, that's, that's one on thing. Yeah. One, of the, one of the other issues we've had with trees is if a property owner plants a tree in the right-of-way and then, you know, 10 years later, the house is sold, we often have the next property owner complaining to us about the street tree that's in front of their house right. that is they, not really one of our street trees. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, trees, I had said no. Plants and shrubs, less than 12 inches, yes. Over 12 inches, no. Concrete, asphalt are both no's. Stone or shells, no. Irrigation is no. Native grasses, less than 12 inches, would be a yes. Pavers would be a yes. Landscape blocks, yes. Fences and retaining walls would be a no. Okay. Uh, no curbs or sidewalks. Yes is for all the, still on the mulch. Yes. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, moving down to trees would still be a no. Okay. Uh, in essence, my thoughts uh, would be the same as the middle column. Middle column. Okay. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Okay. To, right. So just a clarification, this, this is your opinion. Some of it's code enforceable now. Some of it's just yeah. is not, yes. but it's your opinion. Okay. All right. Um, anyway, yeah. And anyway, let's, let's let Dennis go and then we can have you come up again. <clears throat> Good morning, Dennis. Hi, Dennis. Oh. Um, this is an interesting conversation, and, and I have a lot of comments about what's being said, but my comments go back to the f meeting that we had June 1st, and I didn't realize that this is what you were going to talk about today, so I go back to the beginning, okay? Uh, so the topic was on the agenda uh, on June 1, 2020. 22 workshop. At that time, I asked if what was being considered would apply to the entire city or be limited to the beach. The response that will be applied to the entire city, which is what you're doing today. Okay. Uh, since then, I've taken a good look around the city, <laughs> focusing on the right of way in such places as Bay Breeze, Pilot Town Village, Mariners Retreat which is still under development and along city streets. I observed wide streets able to accommodate parking that are well-defined with curbing and some with sidewalks. Um, excuse me. Also, I observed in many of these areas in the right-of-way, there are irrigation lines, mulch, plants, bushes, structures with plantings and trees. Given the layout of most of these areas, there doesn't appear to be any problem with these things in the right of way. So I submit that as it relates to the ground cover, now I'm not talking about the curbing and that kind of thing, but just the basic ground cover, you go take a look at uh, the properties and one, one really key property is look at third, Burton Avenue between third and fourth, right across the street from Ship Carpenter Square. And all the things that are talked about here, you will find in the right of way along that street. And they're beautiful. They're not obstructing anything. They're not obstructing parking. So I don't know that there's an issue there. And that's a great example. Go Pile Town Village. There are sprinkler heads next to the rolled curbing. And that's not obstructing anything. And if you're not allowed to put that in there, you're going to have a problem with your irrigation. So that, that's throughout. I mean, th let's be a little bit practical here. That's not in there. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I submit to you that we don't really need to look at that on the city side so much. And if we do, 
take it for what it is. And it's unique in, in what it is. It's different than on the beach side. So it, it, it really does, you have to look at these things individually in my mind. So what we're really talking about here, you're talking about parking and enforcement of what goes in the right of way. You're really talking about the beach and you're talking about parking. To me, that's what this is really all about. No, it's not. No, it's I, not at all. I, I don't, uh, uh, you can disagree with me, Carolyn. I definitely but disagree with you. That's what I I feel that way. Okay, and, that's fine. Okay, and and then we can respectfully disagree. I, I definitely agree okay. with that. There are real differences <laughs> between the city side and the beach side of this of this town. On the beach, development evolved over the years. Many of the lots were developed prior to building codes with setbacks. The right-of-ways are varying widths. The paved surfaces of the road are not in the middle of the right-of-way. There's no curbing or sidewalks with perhaps one or two exceptions. Some residential parking is not identified. Residents park on the grass in front of their houses. Um, for the most part, what's in the right-of-way has been there for years. However, there are some exceptions where plannings and other items are intentionally placed in the right of way to prevent public parking. I could go on, but you get my point. To preserve the unique character and charm of the beach, it's imperative to address the ground cover in the right of way and parking issues carefully, thoughtfully, and fairly. Using the available information, it has been and is my continued recommendation that these streets on the beach be reviewed individually and give them the same consideration that was given to Rodney Street when settling the Fisher Cove case. One size does not fit all. No matter the resolution of parking on the beach, the demand for parking will always exceed the available public parking spaces, the same as it does on the town side of the canal. Another major consideration on the beach is to make sure that we keep in mind the, capa the capacity of the beach. Some of the dunes are migrating towards the bay and high tides a little higher. So we've got less beach over there. Now, my next comments are follow up to Charlie Atwell's comments at the June 13, 22 mayor and council meeting when he stated the beach side of the canal is treated differently than the town side. The following is a perfect example, which Anne Marie alluded to earlier. As I stated previously, Mariners Retreat is still under development, and there's little, and there is in the right of way of those properties mulch, bushes, trees, irrigation lines, and other plantings without any apparent objection. However, a different outcome on the beach. Recently, my neighbor in the 1300 block of Bay Avenue filed an application for landscaping that included mulch in the right of way. The house faces Bay Avenue on which there is no parking on either side. He received a letter from the building official stating mulch was prohibited in the right of way, citing the Lewis City Code chapter 170 streets, section P4, which in fact does not address mulch, rather it addresses hedges, fences, and walls. He was advised he could put grass in the right of way, but no, no irrigation lines. I raised the question of what code section prohibited mulch or irrigation lines in the run of right of way. I have yet to get a response to that legitimate question. I believe that given this situation, it's possible perhaps he should be permitted to extend his irrigation lines into the right of way. The other example is that earlier this year, the city held a public hearing on beach parking after the GMB, the identification of parking spaces and potential parking spaces. They requested comments and questions. There were many. Although promised on at least two occasions, there has not been any response to the comments or questions. I could provide more examples, but you guys don't want to stay. One more minute. Can I address that last? Uh, I, I want to address the last finish, thing. Okay. We, let one, me one more minute, okay. Dennis. I only got okay. one more paragraph. All right. Sure. Let, let, let Dennis finish with his reading, then. And then I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. We don't have any. Council's the ultimate authority, and I request you review all the information available to you and give direction to those charged with assisting council on development and enforcement of rules and regulations to ensure consistency and fairness. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? I, I'll be glad I, to answer. I want to address the issue of the comments that were 
received, as I previously stated, we received hundreds, hundreds of comments. We had Melody go through each comment and categorize them so that we can have comments on similar items together so that we're looking at them in a coordinated fashion. She literally just handed that off to me a couple of weeks ago because of the amount of work. I have been very clear that we will share the comments and the responses, but that there, with the volume of what we received, we were unable to do it to have anything cohesive to put forward before this season, which is why we gave a, a plan of what we would do for this season and then pick up kind of reviewing where we left off after this summer season. The, the other thing, when you talk about things like um, um, irrigation, I, I will say that is an operational issue because the right of way, there are times where we may need to get into the right of way to address an infrastructure issue or where you don't have curbs or even where you do have a roll curb. If, if an emergency vehicle, a trash truck has to make a, a, a turn and there's other vehicles, those things can get damaged. And then the property owner is looking at the city to repair the damage. So I, I don't think that it's correct to say that, that one, that we're not looking at this on a citywide basis, that we don't need to look at this on a citywide basis because we, and John, you can attest to this, we have issues citywide, yes. but the issues change depending on what that right of way cross section looks like. Yes. So I do want to move on. I mean, let's wrap this up because we've been in this for 45 minutes. So if there's any comments from the table, we'll take those. And then is there anyone online? Tara, you, you've had a, a chance to comment on this subject. This subject. So we'll, we'll, are there any? Uh... I have a quick comment. I have a question. Have... Okay, so let's start with Carolyn. We'll I just simply want to say that this issue is not just the beach. We've made that quite clear that this issue is the city. Most of the comments that I just heard had to do with the beach. That is not what we hear. Jim? I just want a clarification, please, John. On this list, uh, it mentions pavers, and then it says landscape blocks. What are, what's it, can you tell me the difference between landscape blocks and pavers? Basically, to me, in my interpretation, it is the size of the, uh, the stone itself a paver is characteristically only well, just blocks were like, the ones that like like, like belgian blocks that you would stack for a retaining wall or a thicker block a paver is usually only three or four I understand inches what a paver is but that's where uh, a block would be uh a stack larger stack a lar something that could be right? stacked or right. okay. set or placed side by side but it is a thicker eight to 10 inch, maybe thick block. So then, so the issue there then that you're raising, I think what distinguishes the paver and a block is the height that, that is, which would be exposed. The size of the material. Flush uh, with the ground or flush not. With the ground Whether or it's not. flush. Correct. Yeah. And, that, and how much soil is excavated to be able to it. put your bedding material down to install. Got it. Thank you. Very, I just wanted that clarification. Thank you. Yeah, and just uh, in regards to Dennis's comments, uh, I wanted to echo that one of the it is frustrating for a lot of people, whether you're on the beach side of the town or in town, because we have we're not a town of a of a clear cookie cutter subdivision. I mean, we have unique st streets that are, you know, that ha literally a block away, one will be you know, three feet wider than the other. And so it, 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 Dennis is right about going street by street, and certainly in Lewis Beach, there it's bizarre how how it was constructed and where there are dangerous areas and where they're not. And so I, I just wanted to say that, I, you know, I think we have to look at all this citywide, but citywide it's all different, and it, it which this is what makes it time consuming and challenging because it's there's no uniform way to look at i mean you literally almost have to go street by street and any 
And I understand Anne Marie's desire to give the staff clear guidance and also the public clear guidance. And so when the city staff goes out and explains to a property owner, this grass needs to be shaved, cut, whatever, it's it's impeding progress on the sidewalks. They need to have clear guidance that they can show a document that says, this is why I'm here. So that the pushback is not as virulent as Oh, okay. I understand. We need to give them the tools to do the job. Right, and that's what this is all. So, it, there's no comments from the from the online folks. I do. I, what I was going to ask is, Sorry. there's no issue with us. We, it's not a public chat. hearing, but we can have the co the public use this same document that says an attachment to give us back comments as council. Is there any issue with that? No. We, do. no? we have two things okay. in the chat. So, I, all right. Is this working? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Can ground cover grid come down from the, oh, never mind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any issues involving stormwater impacts need to be discussed with BPW. Okay, so that's, that's Tom. Tom. Okay, fair enough. So that's what I was going to suggest. If there's no issue with uh, us using this as a, as a document, one second, Terry, um, then I would encourage folks to get this off the agenda. Maybe we can actually make this on the web on the city's website as an area where people can use this and maybe sub submit. submit it directly or email it to the city. We can we can um, set it up as a comment as a form. I yeah. think. Yeah. On the, and like yeah. Amory said, I don't think this is an exhaustive list here, but so you right. know where if, you if there can. There may be something that we comments. totally missed that needs to be added. Sure, and I don't think we're going to have this, folks, for a July 11th meeting. Obviously, so we're likely oh. to have this on the next <laughs> workshop. Um, <laughs> so that's why I think that's a good next step. We we have a framework. We've we've heard from our building uh, department around what generally you know I will call it common sense or pre, or uh, common practices or uses. So I would encourage the the public to give us back uh, their comments. Terry, last last word for you, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm coming back to the list. I mean, the three items that I really object to are concrete, asphalt, and shell and stone. For me, the idea of dumping concrete or asphalt on what is presumably at this point the pervious surface is absolutely horrible. And uh, it's equivalent for me of dumping oil into the bay. We don't need any more concreting and asphalting of the city. And if there is a right of way which currently is comprised of pervious material, it should not be replaced with impervious material. Now, arguably, we're not talking of thousands of acres there, but still, any inch, square inch of concrete is too much. And then when it comes to the shells and stone, we're going to uh, encounter the same issue that I've raised a few minutes ago, which is once uh, a property owner creates an area which is encroaching and which is uh, where, where he has put uh, shells or stones or similar gravel materials, yes, even if there is no, no parking sign there, People who drive there do not feel that they can block off that space. And if they do, inevitably, if the owner is there, the property owner is there, is, co is coming out of his house and he's starting a confrontation with the person who is blocking that patch of uh, stones or shells because he feels that it is his parking space, even if there is no, no parking space. So I think all the material that is put there in the public right of way should be green material. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Green material. And uh, others, as I said, please use this document uh, to com communicate or emails in general. Uh, we welcome pictures, otherwise, uh, other situations. So the next, uh, hopefully, this next one will move along a little quicker. This is just an update of uh, a five year review of a comprehensive plan, if we could bring that up. And this has uh, been a process that we, we did involve uh, an outside. Uh, consultancy to walk the, the town through a workshop. So we've been into this for a few months now, and they're starting to distill it down a bit further uh, into uh, a few buckets. So um, I guess we've got Savannah is yeah. With see. Us by Zoom. Do you, do you want to see Savannah or do you want to see the document? Uh, let's split screen. Yeah. Is there any way that we can split screen it or <laughs> yeah? <laughs> We can have her and then uh, have her come up. And we'll we'll just have her talk us through what the where we're at and where the next steps are. We'll be 
Yeah. 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 Technical assistant Janet was trying to help. <laughs> Hi, Savannah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, actually, would it be possible for me to share my screen? Yeah, I put great. together a short presentation to kind of walk you guys through the process. That'd be great. Sure. Would you turn down the lights, please? So you just want to maybe also just here. Uh, maybe your slides will do this, please. but introduce yourself and sort of the role that you're playing for the for the city here. Sure. Um, just as a technical piece, it's still saying host disabled participant screen sharing. Um, while that's getting figured out, my name is Savannah Edwards. I am an associate planner with the Rossi Group. Um, again, as just mentioned by the mayor, we were hired to as consultants to kind of walk you all through um, the comprehensive planning process and update, providing a five year update of the comprehensive plan. Uh, which will actually be an addendum. Okay, I think I can share now. So today I'm just gonna walk you guys through the process of um, our overview of the schedule, what we've done so far, and kind of cue you guys up so you know what next steps are gonna be coming. Um, we started this process back in February and then officially had a kickoff meeting with the town in March. Um, that was when we met with city administration to really refine the scope of what we would be looking at in this five-year update um, and talk about possible concerns, hot topics for the city. Then we met with BPW staff to make sure that they would be involved throughout this process, got some input from them on their concerns as well, and then updated numbers and figures um, from their new planning documents as well. From there, we met with the Lewis Planning Commission, their leadership and a subset of planning commission members that formed a comprehensive planning committee. Um, we reviewed the current comprehensive plan as well as current state planning documents, updated census numbers. And from there, we all worked on some ideas that we wanted to get feedback at, hosted a public workshop, and then refine those recommendations based on the feedback. And that is the list of recommendations that you guys have in your packet today. So the public workshop was on April 26th from 4.30 to 7.30 at the Rollins Center. I know many of you guys were in, in attendance and were able to stop by, which was great. Um, we got a lot of really positive feedback and also had an online survey um, for the hybrid style that you know, a lot of people depend on and like today. If they can't come in person, then they can also submit their answers online. Um, because, you know, this is such an involved community and people really come at, like to come out and interact. We actually had 80 attendees in person and only one online submission. Um, but at the actual event, most of the attendees stayed for a long time, engaged in robust conversation, gave us a lot of really good feedback asked appropriate questions so that they were educated on the topics and again, providing meaningful feedback. And they also provided sticky note comments on the subject areas we presented. I'm gonna to touch on what those five were. And then 33 general comments as well that just talked about issues um, like transportation that may have not been covered that evening. So we had five focus areas that we asked for feedback on. <clears throat> housing, historic and cultural resources, annexation, environmental resources, and utilities. Within each of those subject areas, there were four recommendations. And again, that is why um, the document you guys have in front of you today is organized by those five different ca categories or focus areas. Also, they are separate chapters within the comprehensive plan. So these are the recommendations. Um, you know, this is something that we'll turn over to the city. Um, so you guys can go back and view this PowerPoint if you like. All of this is put on to the city's website already. If you go to the planning and development section, um, there's a separate tab for the five-year comprehensive plan update. Um, but the green boxes are the recommendations that we move forward with and are included within your packet today. 
Um, so they generally had very positive or generally positive feedback on them. We also received many comments, as I stated. Again, these are available on the city's website. Historic and cultural resources, we had a couple of recommendations that received positive feedback. One of them was mixed feedback and we decided to expand that to the entire city um, and really define it a little bit better. Annexation, we received generally positive feedback on three different areas for prioritizing and incentivizing annexation of those um, separate districts into the town. Environmental resources, we received positive feedback on all of the recommendations that were assessed that evening. So those have all been included within your recommendations, as well as you saw me breeze through one of the comments that really rung true through annexation, environmental considerations and utilities um, was the importance of public open space to the residents. For utilities, um, we received mostly positive feedback. A little bit of it was mixed though. So that one was really uh, boiled down from eight different recommendations that we were assessing on um, just to see about the favor. You know, Some of this goes into BPW's area, but we just wanted to get back how residents felt about alternative energy resources, as well as these best management type of practices for encouraging uh, sustainability. <clears throat> um, and like I was saying, we boiled these down into two recommendations that are more overarching and flexible for the planning commission to work on. So this was the list of recommendations based on, you know, what was boxed in those, what had positive feedback. Um, I worked with the planning committee leadership from the planning commission and uh, your city planner to really refine these into this document that you have in front of you today. Um, so there is a list of 13 total recommendations that the planning commission voted last month to approve um, to continue to work towards these over the next five years before the next comprehensive plan is going to be developed. And there were two recommendations that were kind of dropped from the list. Um, that was that the LPC will recommend that the short-term housing committee that has already been established will investigate the concept of accessory dwelling units and conduct public outreach to establish what restrictions may be appropriate. And then LPC will continue to work, work with H Park to assess whether regulations on historic properties are sufficient and or too stringent. So like I said, I wanted to leave today with kind of queuing you guys up for what the next steps in this process are. Um, you know, right now we're in the month of June, um, just present, we presented the draft recommendations to LPC this past month. Um, they approved those, so we have those set. Now we're gonna work on finishing up the draft narrative within house then bring it back to LPC so that they can set a public hearing next month. And then after LPC has a public hearing, we'll also have a public hearing with mayor and city council once their recommendation moves for you all to adopt the addendum document. Um, you will have a public hearing. At that same time, we'll be submitting to the state for a plus review that will happen in October. And then once again, the document will come back to mayor and city council um, and we'll ask for actual adoption to occur. So I know I breezed through that really quickly and I can stop sharing my screen now. Savannah, um, but if you guys have any questions. Can, can you back to the timeline slide? Cause I, I just wanna make sure that, that mayor and city council understand to, to make meaningful adjustments or comments if they wish to yes. what what is their window because obviously when it comes back for adoption we don't want that to be uh nope we don't like this or you missed this yeah. yeah so there's two really good opportunities over the next couple of months 
Um, the first would be the public hearing with the Lewis Planning Commission, which is planned to be held in August. And then second, a, plan, a public hearing with mayor and city council. Um, again, in between that time frame, if you guys would like this to come up on one of your workshop agendas or an actual mayor and city council meeting agenda, um, just to be discussed, include any comments, we could also include that um, again over you know, next month, August or September. What kind of buffers built in for the time you get to the end of that? time to when it's submitted um there's really not much buffer left no, is there no. savannah okay. there, there's not much buffer but i think amory can attest to this that typically the state is not going to penalize you um in those last steps you know if they know you are working towards adopting a uh addendum or your five-year update um they're really not going to penalize this city or hold it back from approval too much so the next chance for the public is the August hearing to then, okay. And we've had at every monthly LPC meeting, this is an agenda, agenda item and the public is welcome to give comments. So at the July uh, planning commission meeting, there is an opportunity to make comments as well. Okay, so, um, <laughs> If anyone wants to ask questions about the process, um, I'm happy to take those. Otherwise, there are going to be a couple of opportunities to give comments on specifically to the um, the recommendations. And again, where you can find that is on today's agenda. There's a uh, a list of, as she said, there's 12 uh, broken down into the big, basically uh, five or six different buckets and two that they didn't choose to adopt. So um, please continue to participate in that process and give your feedback there. Savannah, anything else from your side? Nope. All right. Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Andrew, can we get a copy of those charts? Yes. Okay. So can, we can get the. I, I believe um, Janelle just had sent it out to the Planning Commission. Am I, am I right, Glenn? Or, I remember seeing that before myself. Okay. All right, so mo moving along here, I think uh, the reason most are here is for a new business discussion uh, E1 regarding the uh, renewal process for canal lease extensions. So um, I know, uh, Khalil, you've been uh, following this. I don't know if you just maybe just want to introduce this uh, to why this is on here today. Yeah, this um, this is uh, not unusual for Lewis. As we all know, many properties here are, are leasehold properties, particularly Lewis Beach, who has 99 year leases. However, we're learning more and more, at least I am, that there are properties in town that have leaseholds associated with them as well. Uh, in particular, regarding Pilot Town Road, there are 13 properties that have uh, leasehold uh, components to them, that being the property um, from the road, Pilot Town Road towards the canal to the canal and some are you know of all the properties there some are held in fee simple uh completely some have quick claim issues or, or um structures and 13 have leaseholds the reason this has become a little bit more urgent than others is these leaseholds um expire in 2025 and so i the, the mayor and council at the prodding of many uh, folks who are impacted by this ha are starting to take a closer look on how we move forward with these 13 leaseholds. Um, currently, they those leaseholds um, um, pay a fee to the city, I think ranging between, I was told, Emory, between $200 and $800 roughly. $350 too. A thousand. So three hundred and fifty to a thousand is is the range. Um, I know there's concern that well, there's always concern with certainty, and I think every any property owner wants to have certainty that their access to their land and their leasehold or even ownership um, is secure for the for the long term. So. Um, we have, uh, uh, I know Andrew and I have met with a number of residents um, who were impacted by this, and property owners, I should say. And so it, it's come now to before this workshop um, to try to develop a plan forward. 
And that's where we are right now. And I think the plan forward would entail everything from, or I should say plan, the perspective ideas moving forward would entail anything from property owners saying, oh, I'll just wait till 2025 and, you know, just assume you're going to renew that and I'll just continue paying my 350 to a $1,000. Um, or there could be proposals, which we've discussed, where we actually um, take a look at that and update the lease payments to reflect current market values and give uh, uh, property owners the option to renew sooner and potentially at a longer term uh, lease. And what, and another option, which we haven't really discussed that much, would be potentially to offer the space, uh, lease sold to the owner um, for purchase, outright purchase, so they could become, you know, own all their property in fee simple. So those are all things on the table. That obviously, again, I want to stress there's no, no decisions made, but conversation has progressed pretty quickly, and I think that's where we are right now. Coach, could you bring the lights up a little bit? I don't think that we're, we're not looking at any. Uh, okay. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Wake up, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no sleep. We're just so, interested in comments at this time, right? I mean, I guess the, the thing that for discussion is how is it that some are on fee simple? Glenn, I don't know to what extent you may be able to provide some context from your uh, experience, like it's those that are fee simple versus those that are still remain on leaseholds. I don't have a good response to that. Honestly. There, there I mean, was, it's, it's, so I, I found a file from 2006, 2007, um, where our prior solicitor had done some degree of, of research on some of the title information. Um, it doesn't necessarily state where or, or why some are on leasehold and some are fee simple. Um, but apparently it, it, there was some history where the city or the state actually was the owner and it's not, it was not part of the Warner grant, but it was the state, but similar to the Warner grant, the state was the owner and the city, the custodian and the city had the, the right to do as they wish. So that that's kind of where the leases came from. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know there was one piece of litigation in the 2000s, or it was it the 90s or the 2000s, where a, a property owner had done a quiet title and um, the city objected. And that is one of the leases. Um, so one of the leases is based on somebody trying to, to claim the property and the city objecting and then ending right. up owning the property and um, it's now under a lease. Mm -hmm. So that that's pretty much what we've been able to determine and all, in terms of the pre. And also to be clear, the, the those that are leasehold, they pay a a fee for that license but they don't they pay county tax but they are not paying the city property it, tax but it, those that are on fee simple lots are paying both county tax and a city tax correct and and the original lease specifies that they're that the county taxes are to be paid okay i, I think another thing that i just like clarity on as you look at the county tax maps it seems to be for even those that are on leaseholds it's giving them credit for the entirety of the we'll call Ownership. it a land hook mm -hmm. so you know for some not all um, why is that um i suspect it has to do with tax billing since they're responsible for the taxes i mean the county often takes leaseholds and and i think we all know we're an anomaly um in terms of you know the the, the leasing and especially with the 99 year lease stuff um so I, I think, especially because taxes are due, it ends up being placed as as the owner. But there, if you look at the deeds, the the leasee is not the owner. The lease is recorded. 
So I think it's more an administrative oh, function okay. than a, okay. it doesn't doesn't have any relevance to ownership. The other thing that I I can't recall where I saw inconsistency, but I, I think I did was where we're saying that this it's charged on the street frontage, but I think I saw in another place that they were using a calculus of the canal frontage. Right. So, which is it? The canal frontage. It's uh, so the the fee should be based on the canal frontage and not the Pilot Town Road front frontage. And that's based on the resolution that was done in okay. 2015, was it? But the, that resolution states that the rate is per front foot along Pilot Town Road. Oh, it does, does not it? say anything about the canal mm. width, so we are oh, not being consistent. The canal. I I realize that that we are doing that, but. The resolution that was passed by council in 2005 states clearly that it's supposed to be along um, Pilot Town Road with. Uh, so, but I guess that the question is going forward, what what is the... Well, that's what I mean. How, how do you would, want it? Would calculus we would use this if it's the policy is street frontage. Well, right? but that again, that was the policy at the time, and and part of it was setting all of the leases to expire at the same time, so that if the city decided to take a different different approach to valuing the the lease, right. that it would be done consistently and and applied to all of the leases rather than a patchwork. That right. would... And the other thing that's true here is that this resolution has not been modified or changed since it was effected in 2005. Right. So this is the governing document for our policy is what I am suggesting. OK, that's all we have to go on. <clears throat> that's a resolution. A resolution's binding. Binding, they're binding on you as a as a council. Resolutions right. are definitely are typically internal working documents as to how the city's going to operate. Right. Ordinances so, are affect other people. So until that resolution is changed, which you can change at any time, first it is it is your policy. So it's binding on us, right? Got it. Right. right. There was no language in there about when the trigger for the renewal. I mean, that's ambiguous, right? It's just that the renewal comes up in 2025. It doesn't say. It doesn't it's say anything about when we were meant to no. discuss a renewal. No, no, no. So it can be it's September of 2025. Yeah, that's just an the, expiration. Oh, it's right. the expiration date. So you could change it anytime. But you definitely want to do it before yeah, yeah. September. Right. That's, what I'm saying. That's, that's what I'm saying. We're not beholden to say wait till right. 20. No, we don't. Right. We don't have we, to wait. Yeah. No. Right. Right. Just, okay. Yeah. Right. So I guess what are we so, trying to figure out coming out of here today, which is uh, what are we using as the the cal calculus. I think we, as a council, may probably not appropriate to do it in this setting to discuss whether the option to sell is on the table, because in essence, that becomes a negotiation with the city and the the buyer. Correct? Oh yeah, no way. Right. No, that and that's that's information that can be discussed in executive session, obviously, because it's the sale or acquisition of property, which is allowable. For that we would need uh, appraise. I assume a appraisal survey. I mean, we need surveys done. Or can we rely on the? I think there's a few things we'd have to do. A couple of pieces of information the council would want to know is one is 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 it subject to sale? Is there something that's in the right. chain of title that prohibits you from from selling it and it must remain a leasehold? Um, that'd be one. Um, two would be you know sort of just a more general discussion about whether you would like to sell or not sell. And then if you get to a point where you think selling might be an option, then I think an appraisal would probably be appropriate. You know, I think one of the other things that needs to be considered here is how we ended up with the mix of leaseholds versus fee simple ownership. Uh, and I think it would be it would be a worthwhile exercise for us to delve into that history and uh, really understand how how we ended up with this mix. Uh, it, will, it will be a time intensive uh, effort, I think. It's not something that anyone's gonna be able to just put together very quickly, you know, the, the results of that study, but I, I think it'd be worthwhile to understand how we got where we are. I guess my, my question would be, it, there, there would be significant cost in doing sure. that. Of course. So is, is the cost worth what, 
is it worth the cost? Does it okay. affect how you would deal with it in any meaningful way? And, and that's a question for you. I'm just bringing I understand. it up. I understand. It's a question yeah. for And counsel. I wonder what, it, what that means in terms of, we know that we do have these 13 portions how would that affect our decision making as we go down the path? Would it would it alter any of the decisions that we might consider because we knew about the history? Or are we looking forward to seeing what we plan to do about leases or any other matters? So we need to look at the cost. Yeah, I think we need to look at the cost. I'm concerned that if we, you know, played out a study like that, it could be very costly. I mean, I've done a bit of research myself and uh, where I'm, I'm not paying myself, but I'd like to look at that as a question before we even consider that idea. I don't know. I, I may have a little bit different view. I don't know how the history of, we know there's 13 leaseholds and the history isn't going to change that. I don't see how that's going to change that these 13 are not leaseholds. I, I think it'd be very interesting to learn about that uh, and how that all came about because it is kind of unique and different, but uh, I kind of see a little bit of a time issue here as well in that as Anne Marie mentioned, these expire 2025. I think we need to have a plan in place much sooner than that in a plan, meaning options for the, the property owners to pursue. Absolutely. You know, whether it is waiting to 2025 because they would um, prefer to pay 350 to a thousand dollars, but and they're willing to risk, oh, maybe a new council may have different ideas. But I, my, in my conversations, I think there's enough a, a number of people of these 13 who would prefer to have more certainty and renew these sooner than later. And even at a more reasonable um, market rate. Well, that's so, the question I have is what the algorithm are we going to? Well, I think we use? talked about, well, Tim mentioned the resolution um, in 2025, talked about frontage on Pilot Town Road. Um, Ellen Rain has talked about that being on the canal. Right. And then we simply do a survey. I think we talked about this previously a survey, uh, not a survey, excuse Praise me, appraisal. 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 And we can extrapolate from that. You know, based on 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 frontage, what each property is. Well, and, and I guess the question is because typically an appraisal is going to give you um, the value based on acreage or square feet. Right. So the question is, do right now it's based on the cost is based on frontage. Some people have deep I, lots, other I, people have very narrow lots. So. Um, do you want to continue to base it on frontage or do you want an appraisal based on square footage? And right. and the other thing would need to be considered is that some of these lots have been improved. There are structures, they have utilities, and that will affect the value uh, of those properties. And that would need to be, that would be- We don't in, own the improvements. Right. So, no, I understand the lessee yeah. does. Yeah. I understand. And that does affect if that property, if that lease was to be transferred, uh, the, that that person would be compensated for that uh, those improvements. That was my question. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself please. and your address? Three forty six Pilot Town Road. I'm sorry. What was your name again? Gregory Del Coco. Thank you. That was my question is the the leaseholder puts in hundreds of thousands of dollars to improve yep. the property. Would it go off a of square footage? Or are you going to do an appraisal off of, oh, golly gee, look at this property. Now it's worth five times the amount that this one was because that person has spent time, money, energy, and et cetera, into making well, those things. Well, so. the, the appraisal can be done so that you have a, a land value and an improvements value. And it, if, are, are they being taxed on the improvements? Yeah. What, it, what might it happen is that, it, and I think that would need to be discussed, if the lease is simply for the land, we probably need to be taxing the improvements. Exactly. And the other thing that we need to consider here is that many of the lots along here, along the canal, um, they are it's all considered open space uh, but they are being used for commercial purposes there are private marinas along the frontage and during leases and what those are 
I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with if there are those releases or whatever. I know what you're talking. Yeah, right. About. But we don't have a separate lease for those mar those marinas. I'm speaking of those. Okay. You know the but none of the. And, I think they're all owned. I don't think any. I understand that. That's, that's considered an improvement that's been right. made to the pro mm -hmm. property. Right. And that's something that we wish to take into consideration. Thank you. Right, Thank you very much. Yeah. Terry has a question. Yeah. Um, first, uh, you know, this this issue is coming upon us, you know, like uh, a rainstorm on a sunny day, because uh, very, very few people in the community at this point, I think, from the people I talk to are aware that this very complicated topic was going to be brought. And the people that I talk to have very strong opinions on, on the subject. Uh, first, it was a shock uh, to discover that not all the properties that are between Pilot Town and the canal are uh, collectively owned. The understanding of many, many people in the community was that all the lots between Pilot Town and uh, the canal were collectively owned. So it was a shock to discover that it is not uh, the case. To come back on what was discussed earlier on the possibility of doing forensics as to how some of these properties left our common portfolio to fall into private hands, I think, yes, the cost is an issue, but frankly, when you find out that uh, some of your properties or what you thought were your properties have been captured by private neighbors or whatever, the cost is not an issue. You want to know how this happened, and there are practical issues to this. Some of the lands that are currently privately deeded may actually belong to the city. People may have captured these properties through hostile possession. I mean, what you call the, you use different- Adver words. Adverse possession. Tight, uh, quite a title, quite title. Title. Quite title, okay? And in 2005, if I understand and marry correctly, uh, the city fought to regain the property that had been improperly titled to a private owners. Well, there may be other things, and there may be statutes of limitations, which gives us only a limited time of uh, period of time to reclaim what belongs to the city. So, uh, you know, maybe we would need to use volunteers to to do the research, but I feel that it is very important that the city doesn't let its patrimony escape, particularly valuable land, which is on the canal. And I don't say valuable from a monetary point of view. That, for me, doesn't matter. But that valuable in, in terms that this is one of the most beautiful and scenic areas of the city. And we cannot let these lands fall into private, private hands. Uh, if they have actually been conveyed through hostile acquisition or some other form of mechanism, legal mechanism that nobody is aware of. So the current uh, complete fog in which we, we find ourselves, for me, is totally unacceptable. I think the people of the city deserve to know what is owned by the city, what is owned by private interests, and how what was at some point collective property became private interest at some point. This, for me, is absolutely essential. Uh, the other thing is, and I, I think from what I just said, you can understand where I'm going here, uh, the idea that the city would dispose of those lands which are along the canal, which are one of the most beautiful scene in the city, to put them into private hand is absolutely abhorrent, okay? It's it's absolutely atrocious for me. The idea that anybody in the council- Gary, you, you realize the zoning wouldn't change. It's not gonna change from yes. open space to, our, to something that they can build a structure on. That yes, part I doesn't do. change. I I understand. And there are homes along there that are owned. I understand owned. that. But as Tim said earlier, we've already had many encroachments there. Some of the property, the, the buildings that have been built there are transparent. They're, there's screen. You can see the, the canals through. I mean, I should say three see-through instead of some parents. But some of the structures are completely opaque. And actually, they spoil the view for everybody who walks by the canal. Uh, so uh, that, that for me is a problem. And if it becomes private property, it will be de facto, maybe not de jure, but de facto, it will be much, much more difficult to prevent the construction of additional 
uh, I don't know what these structures are called. They're definitely not uh, sheds, but uh, houses. The zoning would whatever. remain the same. And, uh, the zoning does not change. Yeah. The no, relationship does not change whether there's a leasehold or yeah, but currently, the zoning is the same. Yeah, but currently, Andrew, it's open space. It and, is, and, and it, it will is remain not, so. And it is not de facto open space. People are building up on there, some of them with electricity. That's uh, with permits. Sewers, but with permits that should not have been issued. Um, with, the, the zoning ordinance actually allows those items to so the be issues constructed with, within with the open space. Access, electricity, air conditioning, so that you can actually have a studio where you can sleep and leave, live on, on, the, on, on the property. Yes, without an occupancy permit. But de facto, people are actually able to sleep and live in these properties. Some of them have even uh, mini kitchens in there. So, uh, you know, there's a problem. So that's why I'm not completely confident of what will happen once the city abandon its title to these properties. Okay, that's the that well, second. Thank you, Terry. Terry, one more minute, because we, yeah. we typically allow three is, minutes. I feel that there is nowhere for people who are walking or biking along Pilot Town Road to, to make a stop between the, uh, the downtown area and uh, the boat ramp or the Roosevelt, except the little bench, which is uh, a memorial of, uh, across from the uh, dairy. So I feel that the city should reserve its right at some point to uh, claim a right of access. And I'm not talking of the properties that are basically gardens, you know, but I'm talking of those that are commercial, you know, the ones where there are boat ramps and everything. Uh, to, 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 to retain its right to access, uh, its right of, of way, so that pedestrian can actually cross the properties and go along the canal and sit on the bench that the city could install there. Uh, I, I feel that the, uh, these assets, which are collective assets currently, are made totally available to the private owners who have the properties there, but the public basically cannot enjoy the canal to its full because we cannot get there. So that's how I feel. So bottom <laughs> line is, I understand this is, you know, uh, I think it's going to be a much more complicated process than just saying, okay, we're going to do this. It's an administrative matter. It's going to be resolved in 10 seconds. You know, it's just a routine administrative things. No, they are strong feeding some from people on who owns what and what the public can access. Nobody wants to disturb the peace of the people who currently occupy these properties. But at the same time, we would like to find a way to have at maybe one or two intervals, some access to the canal so that the canal becomes again, our collective property. Thank you. And I'll give my notes uh, to uh, uh, the okay, recording. Terry. Thank you, Terry. Come on up, one of, yeah, do Rochambeau to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Karen McDowell, and I'm representing my sister Elaine Bristow and I. Mm -hmm. I just have some background. Um, my father and I were at the settlement table in 1986 when we purchased the property at 518 Pilot Town Road. We purchased it from um, Mr. and Mrs. Bone, and at that time I was at the settlement table with them. They had had the house since 1946. They were in their 80s. They were crushed when they found out they did not have, they were told they had like a quick deed or something like that to the canal front property. Mrs. Bone was very ill and she just started crying. And so at any rate, um, we settled on the house and then my dad and I went back to the settlement table um, and we then chose to purchase um, the canal front. And we then accepted a lease um, from the city. And they thought they owned it. They knew they owned it. And um, so we decided to take the lease. And um, what, what was year was this, uh, Ms. McDowell? 1986, 86. August of 1986. So then in every, um, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. Every um, 10 years, we were allowed to renew the lease at ten dollars a foot, and we paid seven hundred. We pay seven hundred fifty dollars um, a year. Um, my father was close with um, Eleanor Sheehan, and Eleanor Sheehan and other neighbors and some um, people got together, and we 
chose to fight um, to try and get a clear deed to the docks. Um, I have uh, many, many articles and many, a lot of paperwork from Eleanor Sheehan dating back to 1981. Um, a lot of good information that she did all the research herself and she would keep items in the back of her trunk <laughs> of her car. And With she was a line. remarkable woman. She truly, truly was. I wanted to thank Leanne Wilkinson for bringing this issue to us because my sister and I had no idea that this was up for discussion. Um, so at any rate, I do have a lot of the old papers. Um, and then um, we thought when they, when all of you um, decided to change the lease to all of all 13 of us to end of September 8th, um, 2025, I assumed that that was just to make it all consistent. And then in September 8th, 2025, we would then be allowed to then do the same 10 year extension that we have been doing since 1986. So I'm a little confused on the fact that there's now um, maybe different options on the table. Um, let me think what else. Um, so my sister Elaine Bristow and myself, Karen McDowell, we've maintained the property for the past what, 40 years almost. Um, and we've spent a lot of money on the canal side. We've redone the docks um, three times now. Um, we just purchased a water, new water meter. We've just put in new water lines. We do have a gazebo. Um, we do not have sewer down there. Um, but we feel like we've done a lot of work down there. And like someone stated, but we should be um, compensated for the work that we have done down there. Um, my sister cuts the grass every week. Um, so I guess I'm just concerned that maybe this can be taken away from us. And um, we feel that, you know, the Mr. and Mrs. Brown felt they did own it. And because they were so elderly is the reason why my father and I chose to go with the lease. Um, because they did not have the energy to fight it. And that's why, and, and they, they passed shortly, they went, moved to Elizabeth City and passed a few years later. But we were very good friends with um, Margaret Carey, who's of course involved with Carrie Lane. Right. I have a lot of documents from her also. So excellent. if anyone needs to do some research, I do have a lot of the paper, newspaper articles. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's great. Uh, I do want to replace the program. Um, I do want to reiterate that the the concern for the open space is um, a valuable one, and um, I certainly get complaints if I occasionally park in front of my own house um, that my car is there. Um, but you know, literally comes and parks there. Fourth of July, everybody's everywhere, and it's just in the spirit of the good community that you know you just don't complain about things like that. I mean, I prefer for people not to do, you know, donuts on the front lawn because they don't want to go to the corner to turn around and go back to town because they didn't know there was a turnaround. But um, I, I have talked to several of the owners and sometimes owners have simply even gone to the mayor, staying go back in the day and like gotten the deed. So I think there is value in doing some research because some people may have been elderly. Some people may not have had the money and the city has deeper pockets and they may have just been able to force the issue. And, uh, you know, I know my house is one of the pilot townhouses. They used to have their boats out in front, but I also have the complications of a rail running that used to be in front of the house. So every one of those properties would be different, but it is fair to try to see if people weren't watching 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and they just kind of did what they wanted to. They didn't have to get permissions in the same way that we're more focused on it now. Um, I do keep it all as open space. And I think, you know, that is valuable. And I think it's valuable to enforce those things. And I think it's more about enforcement than it is about people having outright ownership. And then if you do do that option, that's a lot of money to go into even capturing other additional open space that you could do with under the same restrictions to keep it open and available to people. So, you know, 
And the last thing is I really am strongly, I don't know, it's probably not in the space, but getting a bike lane or somewhere to get down that street is really, I mean, I'm a, I bike some, you know, it's, it's dangerous. So if we could possibly do that, then that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone online that's um, made some comments? We had one comment from somebody who was asking about the include their name and we do not nope. share i mean that's one of the things under foia is that you have to to share your name if you're going to to comment in a virtual setting so i i responded to that the other comment that we have relates to the comp plan which we can go back to okay what we also don't know is what were the the it is a byway it is a state right. street and there are like Canal front, just step further down. Canal front um, park. There's the byway committee or something like that, and so I think there's a confusion as to what is the future plan of where they're trying to get to for all that kind of right. scenic. You know, mm -hmm. And then we can kind of like align with it because I think we should right. have some forethought on that. Yeah. That's right. a great point that you raised Thanks, uh, because in fact the Pilot Town Road is the entire road is in the byway, and uh, the byway group. Historic Byway Group can should be involved in uh, their opinion. Sh their advice should be solicited. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Leanne, let, let, she she had her hand up first, and then Brian. Uh, Go ahead, Leanne. Hi, uh, Leanne Wilkinson. Uh, I live at one thirty Jefferson Avenue. Um, thanks for talking about this to begin with. Um, this all started with me. I'm buying a house on Pilot Town Road, and I'm going to try to keep this short, but I did make a lot of notes here that I want to make sure that I say. One of the things um, that I think is important is that I understand why they wanted to make everything end at the same time, although none of the Lewis Beach leases end at the same time. Um, they all get to renew their 99 years, and whenever it falls, that's when you that's when your lease ends. So that was a little bit of a concern when I heard, oh, all the leases are now ending on 2025. because so it makes you wonder, wait, what is happening here, right? So then I get that. But I also, and I think I said this at the last meeting, like, you, it, I don't think it's right to make people wait until August of 2025 to know whether their lease is getting extended or not. You do not have to wait if you want, if you have 50 years left on your Lewis Beach lease, you can renew it for the second 99 years today. You can send your letter and you can get your next 99 years and you don't then have to worry about it. So I think that's probably the number one concern that these 13 people should have. Um, talking about selling that land to the owner would be, you know, I think something that a lot of people would be very interested in if you can figure it out. Uh, I do want to say that the value of the land isn't probably in the square footage considering you can't build a house on it. You only can do a gazebo that has, and I don't know the exact rules, but you can only do some sort of open, three-sided open structure. The structures that do have cooking facilities, which I think there's probably only one, um, and you know a bathroom or whatever, those were done years ago when they were allowed to be done and I don't think you can undo that. But going forward, if it's owned by the person or owned by the city, you have rules as to what can be done there. So that shouldn't make any difference either because people can only do what you're allowed to build in an open space zoned property. But if you are trying to value the properties, the value is on the canal frontage, not on the road frontage and not on the depth. The canal frontage is what where the value is. And I think any appraiser would come up with that information. So if you hired an appraiser, that's how they would figure out what it was worth. And obviously you back out the... Um, improvements that the person who who's the leaseholder has made over the years with the permission of the city and getting permits to do so. And it's not just docks and whatever, you know, all this landscaping that like, this is, I mean, like, mm -hmm. it's, this is not a little bit of money we're talking about here. So that shouldn't be I don't think counted in the appraisal when the person goes to appraise it. The property I'm buying doesn't have a stitch of anything on it but grass. Um, but Vince is next door with this gorgeous piece of property. I mean, his shouldn't appraise for more because he spent a lot of his own money on it. Um, uh, what else do I want to say? Um, right now, I noticed that my 
seller is paying on the front footage and she has a lot of front footage but very little canal frontage only 54 feet but my lease is probably one of the highest if not the highest it's or my lease to be is over a thousand dollars i don't know what vince pays but you know i i do know that if the lowest is 350 and i only have 54 feet i think i've got probably the least canal frontage of of any of these leases um so i think that was when that was changed in 2005 that's when they started going by the road frontage because this property has a big amount of road frontage and a small amount of canal frontage. Okay, so that's that. And then I do want to say that Karen, I noticed, has all the, the articles from the whole Mary Lou Sheehan thing, which is the next door neighbor, or not Mary Lou, uh, what was her name? Eleanor. Eleanor. Eleanor Sheehan's was the, this was in 1990, between 1990 and 95. And this went on for years. And I told Carl this when we were talking about it. I was like, this, has been coming up and it's you all should read those articles i just glanced at them and uh back then tony pratt and jim ford who was a councilman were saying can we get can we figure this out now this is crazy let's figure this out and then it just went by the wayside mm -hmm. and eleanor actually somehow proved that the city took this property from her i don't know how she proved it i have no idea i remember being at a lot of the meetings i remember seeing it in the newspaper but somehow she proved and she got that property back. So the property right next to the one that I'm buying owns their canal frontage. I don't own the one I'm buying. Vince doesn't own his. He's on the other side. And then we've got somebody on the other side of that that has um, a deed since, I don't know, Bill Schaub told me, I don't know, like 80 or 90 years. And the city, she tried to get even get the lease. Give me the lease or tell, it's, tell me it's mine. This was years ago when she bought it. Uh, I sold it to her probably 10 years ago. And it just it just didn't happen. Nothing happened. She doesn't have a lease. She doesn't have um she doesn't have like a in fee, whatever you call it, marketable title deed. I don't know if you know what it's called. I should title. know what it's called. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But um, but anyway, I just I think it's 13 people. There's 13 people out of there's probably what would you say, 60, 70 houses on Pilot Town Road. It's a very small number and it's weird that it's like this, but do you really care? Do you really wanna go back 200 years and try to figure out why these 13 people, just figure out what you're gonna do, but don't make everybody wait till the August of 2025 to know whether you're gonna renew the lease and for how long. And I think a longer lease is, was a, is a good idea or a purchase, but you guys will decide, but I mean, that's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's good, Brian. Brian McCarthy, live at 440 Pilot Town Road. I agree with a lot of what Leanne said. It's like, you know, it's, it's, and uh, what Mr. Saliba said, it's the uncertainty. You know, let's make some decisions. There are, going back through this would be very difficult. I mean, it, it's, it's really opening a can of worms. I mean, um, you know, I did some research, just a lot of information on in Sussex County. And one of the issues is their map and the map I have from the city, there's a discrepancy of like 30 feet. In, in the zone so you know so right away there's going to be all kinds of issues on that uh so i don't know how accurate the records are going back um you know, I looked, like i said i did a lot of research and going to the county records and there's all these handwritten notes i mean it's longhand you know, like, you know and it's crossed off and okay this is sold no it's not sold now it, now it's a deed huh you know so it, it's 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 a mess i don't i don't know if you're going to be able to go back through and correct it I, like leanne spoke um let's let's decide i'm going forward on this um yeah i was just gonna say there's the uh i'm not saying that this was done nefariously or somebody's trying to do underhanded things but i think there was just a method that if you knew somebody you were able to get the deed if you didn't you didn't um, so I just think I don't understand why we can't um, just use the same model we have for the beach house, you know, the 99 year lease, just apply it over here. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. It is an option, but um, one thing to be clear though, when you guys approve the 99 year leases on the beach side, you know, those, those are, we always talk about buy right leases. Right. These ones are not 
right. set up as buy rate leases, and that's why they're expiring and you have options. Right. And the resolution identif clearly identifies that we have this mix of leases within the city. It clearly states that it recognizes that they're the 99-year leases and that the leases that were being extended to the lots along Pilot Town Road were not of that type of lease or that term. Uh, it states it very clearly. What's going on? Got a few things in the Q&A in the chat. Okay. Uh, Vince, why don't you come on up and then we'll take some of those. Um, uh, I'm Vince Walsh. I live at 358 Pilot Town. And there's a couple things that I think we were talking about valuing the properties. One is if you've been here during any recent hurricanes, high tides, we're losing those lands. So the value of that property, I don't know how you're going to assess it because if you look where Blake lives, it's a pond. Some days it's filled up. There's ducks flying around. There's geese. What's the value of that? I mean, how do you figure this out, which is crazy? That's the first thing. So you're opening a huge can of worms trying to figure that out. Second thing is, and it's Ray, it's changing. I mean, I've seen it. I never had water up until now I've got it coming up. Sometimes it'll come up more than halfway through the property. So the second thing is, I think that some of the concerns is there are rules and regulations about what can be built, but not only that, there's a landscaping issue so that people can see. Mm -hmm. And if you can't see where people have maintained the property, you can see down to the canal. Whether people have not, there's phragmitis, you can't see anything. So if you want us just to forget it and let it go, you're gonna have a mess and you're gonna be responsible for taking care of it. So I don't know if it's in your budget to maintain those properties, but I spent hours trying to maintain mine. So you can drive by it, you can stop on your bicycle, feel free to look at it, not a problem. But it's, I think that the problem is, is that there's no consistency and there hasn't been, and that's what we're asking for now. Right. Give, us, give us the consistency, tell us what we need, and we're happy to comply with it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Ruth Ruggiero. My husband and I are here. Uh, we live on Cary Lane, which is a dead end lane. And across um, the canal, we own the, the um, property there. And we have since 1989. And um, I've paid, we have paid the uh, $846 uh, lease fee for 33 years, $28,000 that we paid. We pay high taxes, we pay high insurance because it's considered a risk, a uh, high water risk area. Um, even behind our property on Cary Lane is considered a risk that the water could come up from that way too. Um, it, we've made a, we built a boathouse. We usually call them boathouses um, uh, th that we use for um, relaxing. And we have docks and we have rentals of docks spaces. Um, our two of our neighbors on toward um, the university are on grandfathered in lots is what they call them, meaning that they don't have to pay any money on a lease every year. I called one of my neighbors and told her about the meeting. She said, well, that doesn't pertain to me because I don't pay $900 a year for the lease. That's what I understand. Uh, and then Kenny Reed next to us also does is what grandfathered in years ago. Um, the Carries, Margaret and Francis, um, which the lane was named after, uh, lived next to us um, until their death. And um, when they were young, when we were younger, about, uh, when we were having kids of our own, um, we asked them, Margaret, Francis, we were such good friends. We said, if you're ever going to sell the dock property, please let us know. That was just grass, a picnic table with a cement block for a leg and a little rickety dock. You couldn't even walk on it when we bought it. But we have made fabulous um, renovations. We've put um, clamshells in so that we can park. People are always coming in there and turning around in there also. We've had parties um, in July where people thought it was public property and came in and ate with us and everything. And I said, who's that guy? Who are you? Who are those people? And nobody knew. They just thought it was public. They thought it was a big, big city party. And um, as far as I know, I didn't know that anyone was allowed to have a bathroom on these properties. We, every summer, ran a porta potties from A1 uh, so that our uh, just about anybody can walk up. We're not going to bother them, but that people can use that. But I have never heard of anybody that's been able to have anything except water down there. 
Um, we do, my husband did build a shower, which, which we just used with for ourselves. The boathouse, we've just recently had water hookup and sewer, which was um, put in by the city over the past couple of years. And um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, the, the thought of buying it again really scares me because, you know, we're 71. And if we had to pay what we paid back then, that's quite a bit of money that we'd planned on being our, um, to our children, giving given to our children upon our, our demise. But um, are you are you you said paid for the lease right? Is that essentially what you did? Yeah. Same for you. Oh, I see. Yes, we lease it. Some yeah. people are grandfathered in. They you they paid didn't for the to. right to the remaining part of your rent, your lease. Yeah, okay. Purchase it from Mr. Okay. Right. Okay. But, I, but you didn't purchase the land. You purchased the, the lease. lease. The lease. Right. Oh, 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 right. Oh. Purchased the land and accepted. Right. Correct. Okay. It was transferred. Oh, 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 oh. right. Oh. And there wasn't any Okay. Right. Oh, right. Okay. And the transfer awesome. was the lease. Yeah. Right. I have all that stuff yeah, here to I've myself got, too because it was um, quite a bit of money. And at our at, when, 33 years ago, that was quite a while ago. We had a baby and you know, sure, child, and um, it's still a lot of money that we put into it every year, upkeeping it. We do ourselves and. Um, the docks are not exorbitant fees. One of the one of the cheapest rentals, and they enjoy that so much having their boats there. People who can't see the canal because they don't own it can go to the park, can go um, in kayaks, can go in boats. Very popular and very accessible. And uh, we certainly would like to know what's happening. The only reason that we knew about today was because Leanne contacted Karen and Lane, and then they contacted us, um, and. Um, so we knew about it. We came, and we had no idea that this was coming down the road so quickly, because right. um, it's it's a uh, it's a worry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just one more minute. Yeah, one more minute. I just forgot to say something. Um, okay. So, Karen, Karen and Lane have been in the canal and see it. People being able to get down to the canal and see it. I don't know if anybody here knows this, but. I don't know, at least I would say 10 years ago, the Schroders, uh, everybody knows Howard Schroeder, I think here. Howard Schroeder passed away and his family was selling his house on Pilot Town Road. And they had a lease on the canal front parcel. And at the time, the market wasn't good and the house wasn't selling. And the Schroeder, John Schroeder and I were both, I think on Greater Lewis Foundation at the time and Joe Stewart and whatever. but. It ended up being that the city actually we sold the house to someone mm -hmm. and then the city purchased the the lease that the Schroders had mm -hmm. on the property. So that's what she's talking about. It's like mm -hmm. you didn't just get this for free because sure. there was a lease. Right. The person thought they owned it. Number one, those people, the carries thought they owned it. but And so did the bones. But they actually guess didn't. And so when they paid for this property like i'm going to be paying for this property part of the value of what i'm paying here is for that property and the lease and so if you don't have a lease it's just like again i know they're not the same kind of leases but lewis beach mm -hmm. you know what is that it's not worth anything because you don't really own it of sure. course it is we're selling houses for four million dollars over there on properties that people no, have no issue i just was wondering whether when she <laughs> bought it she thought she was buying it fee simple versus buying because well, exactly the same relationship you buy a 99 year lease well, it's the value yeah, of what's left people did think they owned yeah. those and then Understood. it turns out that they didn't have right. the right kind of deed or whatever okay so this wanting to get to the canal thing we do have the canal front park which you know Back in the day, I don't know what it would cost today, but it was $10 million for that park. And the city paid for some of it. And private people paid for some of it. We got grants for some of it and all that. But they did buy this Schroeder property. So they have it. And I don't know what they do except for cut the grass probably, I guess. But there's another access to the canal that the city could open up and put benches and do whatever they want. But that's on the other side of the uh, Little League field. Thanks, Laura. Where is it? Other side of the Little League field. anybody know what the of the house is? I don't remember it, but, yeah. uh, it's, I'll, I'll Amory, are there any questions online? Otherwise, I'd like to move on and then to wrap up what we're going to do at the next step here. <laughs> so, so we've we've got Melinda Kern. Her mother is one of the owners of 518 Pilot Town Road, and she agrees with Leanne's concerns and points about timing and what the next steps are regarding the city's decision about these 13 leases. 
the more information that can be provided the lessee to the lessees the sooner is the better thank you okay so i think there's one question. yeah sure um, are there spaces on Town Road that are open space that are privately held, or the designation of open yes. space? Yeah. Is, yeah. So is yeah, everything open space on Pilot Correct. Town? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. That's I what I was saying. We wouldn't change the zoning or what you could do right. there. Um, yeah. And then somebody was saying, why couldn't the council? He come up to the. Why couldn't the council very quickly just approve? The extension of the leases sure they come back that, that's what we want to get to yeah. next which is you know right. i think that as a next step as khalil said i think we want to come back as council and have some options and one of those right. being yeah if we extend the the leases sort of do we make changes to the fee structure and then do that whilst we look to see if we want to continue to explore uh selling and what those price you know what that sort of price option would look like but i think all of us here are don't you know <laughs> A sh we're not looking to you know take at least you know I, my impression is we're not looking to take these away we're look the reason we're approaching it now is because it was brought to our attention that these do all line at the same time and that there was some were realizing that they were coming up some were were unaware so i think the earlier we can get ahead of this the better i think as a next step we might want to explore consistency around whether it's street frontage or canal frontage that we're charging, do we want to adjust? Do we want to adjust that rate for any for some reason? Do we want to uh, extend the length of these leases or the number of times that they could renew them, and and maybe take care of that first, and then explore as a council? Do we want to then explore the option of putting a value on these properties for for fee simple, if if at all? But I think that it is fair to give an option for a lease renewal. The other, the other possible, you know, there have been comparisons drawn to the the ninety nine year leases on the beach. Uh, that the fee structure of that could also be a, a fee structure that would. It, it's pretty much you pay what the taxes would be um, hmm. on the property. You know, rather than based on. Well, let's look at that. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Let's, let's come right. back with options, I mean, and then yeah, this is not going to be on the July eleventh. No. Right. agenda for no. for a decision but we're certainly committed to giving you options um that aren't going to change your situation yeah um can i just i mean i understand why it wouldn't be on the july agenda but i think it needs to be sure. on you know august or september because i think there is a need and and i've shared some ideas with with my colleagues here about trying uh, very ambitiously i'll admit coming up with at least a, a an option by the end of this year yeah. um, that would give uh, everyone an opportunity to renew um, now and then before you know but by the end of 2022 so they don't so they understand they have the key word here certainty moving forward would that be 20 30 40 years something we can all talk about but it's something that get, should give everyone some clarity and certainty that's my priority. Okay. All right, so let's put um, move on then to uh, our next item. But did you did you want me to go back to the comment? That oh yes, please. The there was a comment that was made uh, regarding the uh, comprehensive plan that wasn't read in. Right. So we we received a, a comment on the comprehensive plan from Bob Heffernan that says that the environmental section of the document is weak and ignores major threats to the city in form in the form of groundwater, daily flooding, or sea level rise. The recommendations need to be more specific and refined. The process has been a schedule with ignoring the issues of sea level rise and future daily flooding. That's with relation to the comprehensive plan. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, the next is uh, just an update from our building department regarding uh, the ICC code. John? Yes, sir. Yep. Mr. Mayor, I've been charged with uh, exploring having the city move to the 2021 code series. This would include the building code, the residential code, the existing building code, the mechanical code and the fuel gas code. Those are the codes that the building department currently enforces. The state has us on the 2018 International 
Energy Conservation Code, and that's by state mandate. And state mandate has BWP enforcing the 2018 International Plumbing Code. So they are not in the, uh, the mix here. The codes that I did mention are the ones that Chapter 70 in the city code requires us to enforce. Also, the property maintenance code in Chapter 148 in the city code would be affected. What I'd like to do is my intention is to, since we're going through several code cycles, is to take, we have to go from the 2012, which is the code series we're currently enforcing and see what the changes are from there to the 2015, to the 2018, to the 2021. My uh, hope is to come back in August or rather to get together with the contractors and give get their input in a, uh, a workshop type format, get their input on the changes and then come back to council possibly in September with the input from the contractors to give the council a comprehensive overview. I believe and Glenn will be able to tell, but an ordinance would be needed to make that change. And uh, adoption possibly for one January, 2023. At that point, any permits that applications that came in would be reviewed and inspected to the 2021 code. Anything that came in prior to that would still be done under the 2012 code. The one thing to note now, council had adopted a residential sprinkler ordinance last October, the 2021 code would be looking at the 2019 edition of NFPA 13D for the single family homes. They now have a provision in there for sprinkler requirements for new manufactured homes. Yes, so uh, Donovan Smith would be the only uh, community that would be affected by this, but something to consider going forward if they were to place new homes in there that when we adopted the code that we adopted in those sprinkler requirements also. Right. And I can give input after I've done the research on it when I next. Wonderful. The one thing I'll say about the sprinkler, I had this um, a neighbor tell me he's building a couple of homes in Abbott Park and it was very difficult for him to find a contractor that would come down and do a uh, small residences that were very small square footage and it took him a, i mean you know luckily he's not uh, he's a man of means to a certain extent and it wasn't delaying it like the delays weren't impacting in a meaningful way but it took him four or five months to find someone to do the work and that to me is not really tenable and when we're already having delays so we may want to you know look at whether there's provisions in there for if you are going to have delays beyond a certain amount what's the deal because that's not really workable in my mind. Uh, delays in getting materials or delays, delays in getting, finding someone who would actually do Finding the a work. contractor, yeah. yeah. The code does not address that. That would have to be yeah, something that council point. would have yeah. to. Right. Um, uh, the gentleman in Abbott is taking, I believe, taking the, manufa the manufactured home out and putting a stick built home. No, these in. are just, these are, um, they're um, open lots that he's stick building okay so he the would the manufactured into... homes have been removed from these lots yeah. already right. okay been script clean yeah. so right i just want to point that out because we, we can adopt things into our code but if it's not really achievable from a you know what good are they i mean so but the idea being that it's because you can't get a contractor yeah we would change your code well, we were told that there was plenty of con when we asked those questions about adopting it we were told that there was no issue with that that there was plenty of people around that uh, there was a big list of people that could do this and, mm -hmm. and so, it's not, oh, it's not working. So we could re reach out to some of the companies and, right. and try to develop a relationship that um, it, it might be easier as some of these new developments kind of go to construction right. because for instance um Lewis Waterfront Preserve, they're going to, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll have enough quantity right. that it's going to make it worthwhile for 
um, contractors to to come and and That's a good do idea. more work in Lewis. I mean, I think part of the problem is because the other jurisdictions don't require it. There, there's not a there's not a whole lot of the contractors are mostly upstate um, and in a very busy time. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we've all done home renovations mm -hmm. during a high market and you, you know how hard it is to get a contractor of any kind to call you back. So yeah. it could, I can't remember what municipality, is it, is it Rehoboth? I know there were a couple of others in Sussex County that were considering. Milton adopted it. Milton, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. they adopted so it. I just want to point, I didn't mean okay. to go off on a different okay. but, the, but it is the, possible that with more adopting it, we'll see more. more. Okay. Yes, and the, I believe, reason the contractors are not is the size of the project. It I, is not economically exactly. feasible I, for them I, to get involved in it. But as Amory said, now, Water, Lewis Waterfront Preserve is going to be 89 units. Right. That you're going to have a presence, a uh, sprinkler contractor is going to have a presence in the city for the next right. several years. Yeah. Right. But he's commercial. No, no, no. Uh, residential. It's uh, their townhouses. It's still residential. It would be a commercial contract. But they, right. but they can still come to a, they, they can still Please. do residential. Because I take more heat in this town about this sprinkler thing than any other contractor Please. or citizen because wow. uh, Paul Kamenish and I, as everybody here may or may not know, are the only two contractors that advocated for the acceptance and approval of this. So when everybody has problems, Russ, Jeff Garrison, Jeff Burton, all of them, they call me and they say, you hung this burden around my neck. I've had at least seven phone calls of that nature. And you're not serving Other on council. Have, no, I don't serve on council, <laughs> exactly. So it is beginning to resolve itself because there are other contractors that are coming on board because there are more houses now that are being built. There right. are, and John could speak to this, I think that currently there are somewhere around 15 or 16 permitted houses that require the sprinkler. So it may be more than that now. Last time it's we climbing, talked, yes. It was in that area. So, and there are other local contractors such as Harry Caswell, who went out opportunistically, perhaps Harry and I talked about it, and he's now licensed and certified it with a different division of his. So, but the reason I spoke up is because the problem has been that many of the, uh, many of my peers in the construction industry <laughs> were reaching out to contractors such as the ones that would do Lewis Preserve. Two different beasts. It's a completely different system. It's a completely different approach. So you have to have smaller shop contractors that are willing to do these one-off deals because they're not going in and plumbing a 24-unit building right. Uh, right. for sprinklers. They're doing one house at a time. There are a couple of others, but I just wanted to bring Is there a feeling that if course. they come in and start, you know, <clears throat> like the waterfront oh, reserve? The fact that, that yeah, well, the waterfront they, reserve will have nothing to do with single family residential homes. Right. Nothing. It's not, Zero. It's Those exactly. contractors are yeah, right. different. What right. I'm okay. saying is as more of the single family homes are getting into phase of needing to have the rough ends done. Mm -hmm. right. There will be more active participants, right. but everybody has driven. been on a learning curve, contractors, mm -hmm. my peers, of finding the right people to right. do these single right. family homes. Right. Right. Rehoboth is now considering it along with Milton. It won't be long before the whole county will make Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Okay. Good. I, what else? Yeah. Respectfully disagree. When somebody, when a sprinkler permit application comes in, there is a seven or eight page list from the State Fire Marshal's office that I consult. As long as that contractor is licensed, currently licensed by the state, I they can submit that application. There are. The thing is, they might not be willing to take the work or correct that and that's and, and that goes back to what mr mayor said about the one individual having a problem getting a contractor right. is a large uh commercial type sprinkler contractor is dealing with 
a building that might have five or 600 sprinkler heads in it. And that's the way they do their, their math is based on a number of sprinkler heads. Mm -hmm. The gentleman in Abbott has 15 and it's not economically feasible for some contractors to load that job, be out there for a day, come back to do the testing and the final, you know, the inspection process that we have to go through with them and they're not making any money on it. Especially because they're largely upstate. But I think with what Randy said about Caswell is now in the business and we'll probably see other local other, vendors. Other plumbers will, it. when the, uh, the city of Newark has had fire sprinklers forever. And the state fire marshal's office set this up so that a plumber or a small contractor could start a business and do strictly residential sprinklers. They have different classes of licenses in the state fire marshal's office. So the larger commercial guys are a class one license and a residential sprinkler contractor might be a class five. And you can only work within the limits of your license. The class one can do everything down from that, but the class five, which is the bottom, can only do the residential sprinklers. And as the, the comment was made, as we have more and more uh, development coming online, there will be more sprinkler contractors interested in working in the city. That's my feeling anyway. And that's what was, was discussed when this was approved. Everyone knew that this was not a mature industry down here. Right. And that, as you mentioned, Harry Caswell, you know, entrepreneurially says, yeah. I'm going to get into this right. business. It's, and so it, it, it but we, that was discussed. And so what, I don't think it's a shock right. that some are having initially a, a hard time. Five months is a hell of a long yeah. time to wait, but that was discussed, I recall. And, you know, hopefully you know, people will recognize there's a market here. Yeah. All right, John, what else you got for us? Uh, the code change will also address, uh, in the, the short time that I've been here, I've seen a couple of gaps in both the uh, inspection process and plan review process that updating the codes and getting the staff trained on those will uh, close some of the, the gaps that exist. And do you expect to be bringing those code change? These are ICC changes or these uh, are city codes that you're speaking of? The changes in the ICC code will impact the city code somewhat. Right. Mostly in changing the city code section to read 2021 building code, 2021 right. residential, et cetera. It's the reference that it makes. A lot of them will be just uh, simple code references, yes. Right. So you'll, you'll have a workshop with the contractors and such sometime between now and August, end of August, yes. and then you'll come to us. That's that's with... my expectation, okay. yes. Okay. Perfect. That's good. All right. Any comments from the uh, public on this one? No? Okay. That's going to check. <laughs> okay. All good. Okay. So um, just for actually for Janet's sake, we're going to, I'm going to skip the strategic plan. I, I'm going to say we can put that to, yeah. to next month. Why don't and we I, do can, that? I can email you my plan for it. Sure. Right. Plan for the plan. Yeah, yeah. So and, and we, can, we, we will move that one just for purpose of time to the discussion on strategic plan. And we'll, we'll ask Ms. Reese to come up uh, around HP Smith park budget. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council, um, for the opportunity to speak with you this morning regarding this project. Um, this project initially started um, in 2019. We were able to get an outdoor recreation park and trails grant, which was a, a matching grant. So um, I think you all have a handout, um, kind of like a little budget sheet. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so if you just wanted to go along and reference that as I speak. Um, uh, Ellen Lorraine handed it out this morning. It's this. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. It's very fancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I said, the original project um, was 
uh, costed out in 2019. And the total project cost was $73,882. Uh, we did receive the grant, which was a matching grant. Uh, so the city's uh, cost would be 36941 And then there would be a 50% match uh, from Denrec Outdoor yes. Um, parks and Recreation and Trails. Um, so the grant was uh, 36941 as well. Um, <clears throat> the project was basically suspended um, in 2020 because of COVID and the uncertainties of um, the world and finances and whatnot. So um, I picked up the project. Um, as you know, I started in September of 2020 and I picked up the project in 2021 when you know we got to a point where we felt that financially we could continue with the project and move forward um, so in 2021 um, our expenditures on the project were a total of 30,131 um, and that was a cost to the city of $15,065.47 and again the matching grant. And that was at the conclusion of 2021 that was the sum of yes. what our expenses yep. were. Okay. And Thank so you. so the pro the work that was done was um, the ADA walkway from the parking lot at George H.P. Smith Park into the um, playground area. The pathway goes up to the existing playground, and then it turned left to um, meet up with the swing set, right. which was uh, installed as part of this phase of the project. Okay. So we did the walkway, we did the swing set, the mulching. Uh, we also replaced the fence, and then we had to do some regrading. Um, so those were the expenditures thus far for the project. So um, the remaining balance that we have is $43,750. Um, what remains in the project is the continuation of the walkway to a pavilion and the pad for the pavilion. So you'll see under the remaining project costs, the pavilion and installation is $43,195. Um, the walkway and pad are estimated at 20 and um, we would like to put electrical service to the pavilion um, for any other activities that might take place other than just a picnic lunch and some shade. Um, and as an example would be perhaps the um, farmer's market, they do cooking demos, you know, they would certainly be welcome to share that space um, during that time. Um, so that brings the remaining costs of the project up to 65, thousand one hundred and ninety five um, so that number <clears throat> um, minus the current balance brings us down to a total of twenty one thousand four hundred and forty four dollars um, to complete the project so um, my ask here this morning um, is consideration of of the funding uh, the additional funding needed to complete the project this year last question Yes. Um, it, 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 we Denrec is no longer a partner at this point in time. Is that correct? No, they are. They are. Um, we have done um, extensions on the grant, and okay. um, Denrec has been very gracious given the um, current situation with COVID and understanding sure. that projects have stopped. Um, but they they are still partners with us in in this uh, project. Right. So we still uh, so have about $22,000, give or take, right. to, to of, grant, grant, of, of the grant funds right. that have not been reimbursed yet. OK. An extension so, of, excuse me. Uh, uh, my, so their grant, their their first grant was for 36.9, right? Correct. OK. And they have we, not. They have reimbursed um, uh, 15000 Sixty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. So we we expended thirty thousand one hundred and thirty-three. Right, and thus far, and that was split fifty-fifty between the city and and the grant. Okay. And okay. So and, 
I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, please. Okay. So if you look at that first line, the total cost of the project, right. it was split 36940 So if you subtract the 15065 right. from that number, um, you've got about $20,000 remaining, both from the grant as well as from the city. <laughs> Right. And that's to do the extension of the wall. And, we, and the pavilion. It's, and the pavilion and, uh, and the electrical. electrical. And, and, and I think an, another factor, as I mentioned, these the initial estimates in the, and the initial budget was based on estimates from 2019. Right. We're, we're in a different world. Prices mm -hmm. have gone up, materials, right. shipping delays, um, yeah. labor and materials. So um, that was another issue that factored into the increase in so costs. Do I, thank you, Janet. So do I understand originally the project, total project cost was supposed to be just shy of $74,000? Correct. Okay, and now we've had some expenses and we have a, we have a remaining, uh, we've spent, let's see, um, 30, plus uh 20 wasn't it 30 plus 20 we've spent 50,000 is that no, correct no we've spent no, 30 no. 30, just a total of 30 correct yes. total of 30 yep. okay so the I remaining apologize. balance between the grant monies mm -hmm. and and the city money is 43,750 okay that's what's left of what's budgeted through the grant and right. through city funds. Right. But, but the total right. remaining cost is right. sixty-five thousand. That's the next total. That's, that's what I'm going. Yeah, that's and fourth right. item twenty-one thousand. Right. So Correct. That, and is this is Denrec able to con help contribute towards it's that twenty-one? It, yes, they will still contribute. They have twenty thousand dollars left as well. What he's saying is, what, can we amend the grant to increase the amount? And that right. that would be a separate. I think it would have to be a separate grant. Because, I think so because typically they, they actually, allocate the funds according to. And but they've made some accommodation to because of the COVID effect. Right, they so can forth. extend they it. Can extend the the project timeline. Right, right, right. Extending but the timeline is different and increasing from funding. The amount is, is two different things. Yeah, correct. Correct. Is that something that you think that you will be prepared to go to Denrec and ask? Well, we were requesting funding from them for other yeah. projects. How about the yeah. school? Is, is Cape on pitching some dough? <clears throat> I'd be surprised, but we can ask. Don't ask, you don't get And the, I mean, they'd benefit from you're, that. You're, you're, from the, the, yeah. considering that. So the costs that you have now received for completing the job are 2022 estimates. Is that yes. correct? Yep. Yes. Well, and they're firm quotes. They're firm this quotes. Point. Are we is yeah. this on here today because we need this to move forward? Like because right now she can't I've, she I've, can't commit to the contracts that right. we need because we don't have the that's why all the funds in place. And I, I, is it preventing the, the thing from being used? I mean the playground. No, the playground is still being used. The playground and the swings are being used. Um, but I can't I can't move forward with the continuation of the walkway and the pavilion. Um, at this point, and I've I've requested another extension on this grant through the end of the year. So if we don't go forward, we ri risk losing the. We yes. risk losing What's this, the or yes. and or prices going up. Again, okay. okay. we're right. fighting against that. Right, right. And okay. is your event your contractors are prepared to execute in the next sixty days, something like that? Are they? They're, they're ready they're, to go? Yes, they're waiting on me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Again, yeah. it, we're talking about fighting the yeah, course okay. change. And, and, do you have any questions, Candace? I'm ready for a motion. I was going to say, do yeah, we, have, we have a motion? Yeah. I think she wants I, to make. I have a I'd like to make a motion that we approve Absolutely. the additional twenty one thousand four hundred and forty four dollars and forty nine cents for the execution of the George H P Smith Playground project. We have a I'll second, second on that. that. Okay. We got, a, we got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> any, any opposed? I, no. 
As a former member of the Parks and Recreation Commission, I'm happy to say yes. Okay, so we're He's good. He's so it's a five zero for, for Kayla's. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kayla does a five zero. Yeah, five zero. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank so you. Quiet. I okay, then on the last one, I'm actually I am going to recuse myself it's simply because I've in the past I have with uh, issues dealing with off street parking because I also do not have off street parking myself. So I'm going to hand the gavel over to our esteemed okay. deputy mayor here <laughs> and um you can all you could probably uh, adjourn to when you're done because sure this is the last item i get to hit this okay thing. so yeah you get to hit it yeah <laughs> and, and know, that, I not me. yeah no so you will adjourn too. sure yeah. Um, Thank you, Andrew. Okay. So the, the uh, last item on our agenda is discussion of a request for designated parking for 117 and 119 Front Street. Um, after reviewing some of these materials, this is another example of a property in Lewis uh, that does not have off-street parking. And I think Mr. Randy Burton is here in, to explain a little bit more about his request and and the, the, well, first the dilemma you're in and the request. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor um, uh, and uh, members of council. On behalf of my wife Ricky and I, and it looks like we have another attendant of the family. Our son Will just graduated from Tulane University, not with a law degree though. So you guys are in luck. <laughs> oh, but, uh, but, but it's okay. But but, but, but uh, uh, Deputy uh, Mayor Saliba uh, knows that young lad a little bit. So oh. anyhow, um, yep. I appreciate you guys <laughs> giving me the opportunity, as uh, Anne Marie did a month or so ago we had a meeting um with uh dennis and uh from the parking and uh, uh mayor williams myself uh to discuss this and uh I'm, a, I'm i'm gonna believe that each of you has the packet and have reviewed the packet of information so i don't want to belabor this any longer than to say you know i come up here before you as i state in the um uh, in, in this uh in this email or in the letter that i presented uh fully cognizant that i'm a grown man and i purchased the property knowingly uh without off-street parking at the time i also uh uh petition you to recognize uh the the third paragraph of of this which indicates the dramatic amount of growth uh, that we have seen in the last three years in Lewis, and that is like a rocket taking off. And I also recognize that there are some members of council who might want to lay at my feet that I am responsible for some of that. I'm responsible <laughs> for 34 of those units, but not the uh, six to 9,000 that are sitting on our doorstep. And that's not an exaggerated number. And I hope that each of you are cognizant of that number because that's a real number. When um, uh, when Mitchell's property goes to six units to the acre, mm -hmm. there is no stopping the county from approving every other AR zone property on the doorsteps of Lewis, east of Route 1, northeast of Route 1, to my dear long, lifelong friend, uh, Deputy Mayor Saliba, because we talked about it in my office, and he was like, what's this east of Route 1? We don't have any property that's east of Route 1. So... When I look at that as a owner of a pretty significant property in this town, um, both from a historical perspective, uh, I live there, uh, I'm blessed to live there. It is, it chokes me up. I have to pinch myself most days as a boy who grew up in this town that I've been able to not only acquire uh, the residence that we live in, but now to own uh, that entire property. Mm -hmm. But it's a challenge. And one of the reasons that I asked for the meeting with Anne Marie was out of a bit of a fit of rage because my park mobile was fully paid up where my car, my wife's car was sitting and I went out to get in it and the wheel was encroached over the white line in the adjacent parking spot because when I parked the car there, the car that was sitting next to me was encroaching into that and it was the only remaining spot. So I received, after paying $4.55, which I pay hourly at <coughs> nauseam, and 
thousands of dollars in $30 parking tickets. But my son can attest to the fact that last year I said, we're not paying tickets to the city of Lewis anymore. If you can't put the park mobile on your phone and pay the fee, go to the Little League field and park. But I walked out this day in May, very early on, the parking lot at that point was pretty full and I had a $30 ticket on my car. And I pay a lot of taxes in this town, both personally and professionally. And I was fully paid up citizen at that point. My $4.55 <laughs> had been taken off Park Mobile. So I said, I need a long-term solution. It's not like I hadn't already sought other long-term solutions. I've talked to other members of council about this, mm -hmm. to uh, Mayor Williams. Uh, when the Citizens Bank property transferred, I know the gentleman who bought the property. I sought being able to either buy the alley next to the 1812 property or leasing those four parking spaces along there. They had already entered into negotiations with Compass. Compass now has the lease. Their lease takes effect sometime within the next couple of days. I don't think any of us think a real estate office on 2nd Street where that bank is is the best thing, but that's what it's going to be, and they're not going to lease me property. I worked with my neighbors adjacent to me that years ago when Rush Ellis was building Mariner's Way. He offered the original constructors of 117-119 Front Street, otherwise known as Mariner's uh, Time Exchange Condominium, the opportunity to pass under that building to access it. Those two gentlemen wanted to put a swimming pool in versus putting parking down there. My wife and I discussed it a couple of years ago. We'll get rid of the pool. We'll put parking down there. We've been not, not able to prevail with getting a right to pass under that property from our neighbors. And I understand that. They're perfectly happy to do it with us, but they might not know who the per person in the future is that's trying to access parking. I have other options, which I've talked to Anne Marie about, but I don't think anyone in this city wants to see what my other option is. <laughs> Because my other option is, and I'll tell you exactly what it is, I will turn Albert Frank Jewelry Store, Aquamarine, into a parking garage. <clears throat> it's the only other option I have. I think it would be devastating to downtown Lois, to the historic nature as a member of H Park, to see that property become a parking garage. We have a viable tenant in there. You should see the traffic that she's created. She has more traffic in there than Albert Frank ever did. She's selling <laughs> smaller increments, so she needs more traffic. Mm -hmm. I think my proposal is more than reasonable. I am, or we are, the only in fee, and we're not any different than Lewis Beach, in fee, 99-year lease property in downtown Lewis, on this side of the canal that does not have non-metered parking within the block that the residence is built in. The only one. You can go out and survey every property. I've already done it myself. It's the only property that's that, that's, that's the case. Well, I think you've laid it out pretty well, Randy. I mean, I think we've all... Uh, all read the packet and yep. have heard about this and and i should point out that you know the issue of off street parking uh well for res for homeowners who do not have off street parking we have there is precedent we've remedied this in town um on market street and recently on lewis beach with I don't, four or five homes who applied and got um, resident only parking signs. So right. your request isn't out of bounds and it and it's not without precedent. Right. But I think um, it's an opportunity for us to talk about it now a little bit and, sure. and then we can um, see where that takes us. Does anybody have any comments or concerns or questions of Randy or? Well, he stated by starting saying that he knew what he got when he bought it in terms of knowing you didn't have parking when you bought that property still rings with me. I understand your problem and I respect your problem, but I have a difficult time understanding um, what to do from here, given the fact that when you bought that property, you didn't have parking then, correct? Help me understand that. 
That is correct, uh, Commissioner Jones, but the city of Lewis has changed dramatically in the last three years. And over the course of the next five to 10 years, if Sussex County allows 9,000 houses to be built on the borders of this town, it is a much different situation. Having been living in this town for the last 57 years, to put this property into historical context for you a little bit, if you look at my property, our property, the city, we actually grant a right of way to the sidewalk of two foot 11 inches because my property goes on to the city's property. So we've granted that easement to the city and years ago, prior to that happening, and then the sidewalk goes out another 21 inches beyond that into Front Street. Before that, there was parking in front of that property. When Nancy Grazing owned that property, who was the post postmaster for the city of Lewis, she had parking there. When the city took the parking away from them, the city granted her family a parking space in front of the post office. So it's not without precedent for the city to have accommodated the property owners of 117, 119 Front Street. I did buy it knowing that there was a parking problem, but the parking problem that we have is a much different parking problem than it was even three years ago. And I think that you would attest to that. I see you walking around town. I see the very uh, proactive stance that you and uh, Deputy Mayor Saliba have taken to create a bus. We didn't have a bus in Lewis three years ago. Didn't need a bus in three, Lewis three years ago. But when more and more people come here, parking is a challenge. It's a very unique property. It is the only property town side in the city of Lewis that does not have parking in a non-metered. This is the key element here in a non-metered zone. So I am being penalized financially, not by paying the meter, but by getting tickets for having my wheel over the white line when I paid $4.55 to park there. That's preposterous. Gotcha. That's hey, preposterous. Before you sit down, I, Rand, I'd like to ask you a question, just to clarity, Randy. Uh, when you described the postmaster who had the parking space, I believe you described it in front of the post office building. Is that correct? It was on the city's, well, it's from the Del line. Dot Street. Right? Uh, it's really Del Dot Street. That's not yeah, the city street. That's it's correct. Del Dot Street, but it was on the city street in front after the sidewalk was changed, Commissioner Ritz. Yeah. Right? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I understand she what you I, I just want to clarify. The only, uh, um, Ms. Randy, Ms. the only thing, probably could this is my question. Mm -hmm. My question was was that an assigned designated spot? Based Where, upon my conversations with Larry Anderson, I have not spoken directly with Mrs. Grazing because she's now 94 years old and not in the best of health. But sure. under, based upon my conversations with her son, Larry Anderson, who many people here would have not, would know, that is my understanding, that it was a, an assigned designated parking space in front of the post office. And again, you have to think about there were not you know, 3,000 people a day because Ricky sits in her office and watches how many people. We didn't have that many people that went to the post office in right. Lewis back then, right? We're talking about 1984 is right. when she sold the property. So, or even better still, in that era, if they did not use that designated parking space, they would have been parking in Canal Front Park, which was free of charge right. until yes. I believe it was 2000. Four or I don't know if yeah. there's anybody. I, I think agree. it was 2004 when right. we made that metered parking. Right. Thank you. I just wanted that clarity. Thank you. Candace, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, no, not at this time. Hmm. Um, so I think, um, so thank you again. Ray. Oh, Chip. Uh, Chip Davis, 115 East Third Street. Uh, I didn't have privy to the package, so I'm not exactly sure what Mr. Burton is asking for, just as a citizen. Could somebody explain that? Sure. There you go. Oh, yeah. I, you could have a copy of it. Yeah. Well, let Randy explain it because people. Could, could you just explain it for the public? Yeah, I know. I know where the building is and everything. So, what, do, what Randy? Why don't you just well, you explain, articulate yeah. where exactly the two parking spots are? 
Uh, well, what we've requested is uh, that there be two par parking spaces designated in the 1812 parking space, oh, parking okay. lot. Greg, I know, I know these two, I just wasn't sure of that. Yeah, these okay. two right here, mm -hmm. and they're marked on one of the maps. Okay. And then uh, we also have made an application on behalf of the other property, 119, that we own, and we are willing to have those parking spaces be the next closest non-metered spots, which would be someplace in the region of of the old uh, Hilly's Rick r &L liquor package store along 2nd Street. Sure. Good enough. I, I just wasn't sure what he was referring to. That's right. all. Thank you. I don't know, four spaces, uh, but two in. Okay, I got you. So, um, so I think we got a pretty uh, No more questions from, from the table here. No more comments. Uh, thank you, Randy. Um, and are there any questions online or, or comments? I don't. Okay. Andrew back. Well, great. Um, does Andrew need to come back he's, in order to he's get? Not he's, he's not coming back. Okay. He's not coming. Okay. Well, you're then I think that concludes our agenda for today. And um, unless there's any more comments or questions from the audience, I think uh, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, one thing to think about <laughs> I wanted to do that. as we approach <laughs> the, the July 11th meeting is yeah. our trial period for the workshop. Yes. Is we need to evaluate it. So I'm going oh. to actually, it's not on the draft that you got before, but I'm going to add to the the agenda, agenda for okay. the 11th and I'll also I think of today's stuff the only thing that was ready for the 11th is um the one you just did Marie. okay right already I think everything else we kind of said needed we're delayed yeah because we need more okay. information all right agreed okay. yeah thank you all right thank he's, you guys. he's not asking for I see you he's asking for four spots well, somebody I gotta move thank you sir. Okay, well, so I'll be back to you, you at one o'clock. I wanted to get it straight. You lucky guy. I, 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 I didn't know what to do with my phone. Thank you for making me sure I didn't get it. It was nice because.